Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear rector, dear chairman of the board of trustees, dear colleagues, distinguished guests. I am Funda Songur, acting director of Piri Reis University Maritime History Research Center. I am welcoming you from our university campus located in Istanbul. We are very glad and excited to have you online in our international symposium on the Black Sea Maritime History. First of all, we do appreciate for all academicians who sent us their valuable research during the application. We also thank all of you for being here to be part of the symposium. Before starting today's discussions, I would like to mention that besides its academic curriculum, Piriris University is dedicated to research Turkish maritime history and convey the knowledge of this field to the future generations. For this purpose, Maritime History Research Center was founded in 2013. And since then, the center has been actively involved in national and international academic events. Today, we will be giving special focus to the Black Sea and I will be hosting you throughout the event. Before starting the program, I would like to make an announcement. Please keep your microphones muted at all times for a better listening environment for everyone. This Zoom meeting is also on YouTube alive. If you somehow lose your connection and cannot back, uh, get back on Zoom again, please follow us on our university channel on YouTube. We will be starting with opening remarks that will take place for coming half an hour. I kindly invite Admiral Metin Ataç, President of the International Scientific Committee for the first opening remarks and comments on today's program, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Funda. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Admiral Metin Ataç. I'm the member of board of trustees of the Paris University. Today, I'm very happy to be able to speak to you all from our university, from our Maritime History Center. Of course, Paris University is uh, one of the major university, major maritime university of Turkey. Uh, this is, uh, of course, because of uh, pandemic uh, reasons, we are obliged to speak via Zoom through the glass. I know everyone has got tired of speaking to glass, but what else can we do? So uh, until such time, we could do it face-to-face uh, -face Congresses. We have to go on to do it via Zoom. It is good to do uh, without doing anything, as I understand. Of course, this is our uh, eighth event since we started in 2012. And the 2012, we started with the Erosion Maritime History Congress. That was the big Congress in Istanbul. That uh, was uh, around 107 researchers and scholars, academicians uh, participated in that Congress. Then, of course, our, our second Congress was in St. Petersburg. That was the uh, Congress on History of Russian Maritime History. 100 and, around 160 uh, academicians uh, uh, participated in that Congress. As you see, that was the huge, huge Congress. Then, of course, another one was in Venice, history of Mediterranean, then history of Cyprus. History of Cyprus was also a very important Congress. Uh, my friend, Professor Posnikov, who is the guest speaker, who is the uh, keynote speaker of today, also participated in that Congress. And he had given a very important topic at that Congress, that was the uh, um, Matvey Kokotsev's uh, works on the uh, uh, Cyprus charting. After Cyprus, of course, we have another uh, 
Congress here in Istanbul in our uh, university. That was the history of uh, shipbuilding. Right now, the proceeding is being going on. Has been the proceedings is being done by the uh, Professor Dejendra Kuto from Sorbonne. Almost finished. It was another masterpiece on the history of shipbuilding. After that, we had another one in Monaco. That was the history of measuring world oceans. Uh, and then, of course, pandemic came and we started the Zooming. And the previous one was a symposium on Zoom online. That was the history of Eastern Mediterranean. This one is the history of Black Sea. And the next one will be uh, the uh, Pirates Com Conference International. We're going to invite all the scholars and researchers from all over the world to Turkey, together with Pirates University and the Turkish Historical Society. We are going to uh, perform face-to-face -face conference in Turkey uh, in spring 2022, if the pandemic ends, of course. Of course, today is Black Sea. Black Sea is very important, not only today, but also in the history because of its uh, unique position strategically and geopolitically and geographically. Uh, Black Sea always attracted the major powers interest throughout the history. Uh, today, uh, before not to forget, I owe heartfelt thanks to our esteemed rector, Professor Oral Erdogan, and also to our president, Mr. Tamer Kran, uh, enabling us doing such researches, such congresses in the university. Uh, really, they have a great interest in the maritime history. Thank you very much. Uh, today, uh, we have very, very important keynote speakers and, and also important uh, speakers in our uh, symposium. Uh, Professor Alexei Posnikov, uh, he's the uh, full professor of Russia. Uh, he's the honorable scientist of Russian Federation, and he's the honorable member of Russian Geographical Society. He's the uh, director of uh, Imejo Mundi International Journal on the History of Cartography which is published in London, as I understand. And above all, he's my good friend. Uh, welcome, Professor Posnikov. We are very honored and very happy to have you in our symposium today. To give an idea who doesn't know him very well, uh, you know, uh, Professor Halil Inaljik. What is uh, uh, Halil Inaljik means to Turks? Professor Posnikov means the same to Russians and the whole world. Uh, we have another guest speaker this afternoon who is uh, Alexander, Professor Alexander Mika Beridze from Louisiana University. Uh, because of the hurricane in Louisiana, first we are afraid it. Uh, uh, not, uh, because of the electricity cuts and other problems, but thanks God that there is no problem right now and he'll be able to speak to us today. He's going to uh, talk the source of all seas towards the new history of the Black Sea. It's gonna be a very interesting, he's a, he's a historian. So also I'm glad that he got participated in our conference. We have, uh, Professor Naira Tabidze and Associated Professor Dr. George Gabedewa, 
uh, they will uh, uh, speak about the connection of the Nobel brothers with Adjara region and the development of oil industry. Afterwards, we have lecturer Mehmet Yakshi and lecturer Salahattin Alp Erkutulmush. Their subject is silent witness of the sea lights, Black Sea Sea Lighthouses. This is also another interesting subject. I have PhD candidate Emir Yener. He is my friend. He participated in our previous congresses. He participated in our St. Petersburg Congress. He's going to talk Battle of Dnieper, Liban, and the fate of the Black Sea, 1787-1788. Then we're going to have a questions and answers period. Afterwards, starting with the uh, after lunch, of course, so we're going to have a one-hour lunch break. Uh, Professor Mika Baridze. After him, I have PhD candidate Luigi Chucker. He's going to talk salt smuggling in the period of international trade in Ottoman Black Sea. Then I will have my good friend, Professor Mitat Çelikpala. He's the deputy uh, rector of uh, Kadir Has University. Of course, he's going to talk Black Sea history, Black Sea today, and the Black Sea tomorrow. He's going to some kind of a, make a connection between history and tomorrow, he, he's going to do this job for us for today. Then afterwards, again, I will be uh, together with you for the closing remarks, and I will wrap up the uh, conference. I wish you all a very good symposium and luck. Thank you, uh, Funda. Dear Admiral, thank you for your contributions and explanation on today's program in detail. Now I would like to invite Professor Dr. Oral Erdogan, Rector of Piriris University for opening speech, sir. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege and pleasure on behalf of Piriris University to welcome you online here today. After the Black Sea Maritime Conference, which we held in February of this year, uh, and which we thought was very uh, beneficial, we wanted to leave the subject to historians this time. We are delighted to have you with us to participate and share in our Black Sea Maritime History Conference. As uh, you all have witnessed, tensions, problems, arguments, and even wars never cease in our world. Increasing the welfare of nations should not necessarily mean that while increasing the welfare of one nation, decreasing the others. But what happened is that this is how it will go. To increase the welfare of a country, more comes essentially to consume. In order to consume, it's necessary to produce by himself or dominate those who produce. It's also necessary to control or seize the raw materials necessary for production, enough is needed. As such, it becomes prominent to acquire valuable raw materials, especially oil and natural gas, in order to increase the expected welfare for those who have power and to facilitate their trade in their favor. Dear participants, I think we need to listen to our historians better in order to understand the true cause of the wars of interest and to explain it to everyone in the world and to put a stop to the wars of passion. Before concluding my speech, I'd like to thank the Chamber of Shipping, Black Sea Maritime Association, the chairman of our scientific committee, Mr. Atach, and its distinguished members, keynote speakers, Professor Postnikov and Dr. Mika Beridze, and all the speakers and you valuable participants. Now, I leave the floor to our chairman of the board of trustees who motivates us for this kind of events. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear professor. 
Now I kindly invite Mr. Tamer Kran, Chairman of the Board of Trustees for opening remarks. Please welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Funda Hanım. Thank you, uh, Rector Erdoğan. And thank you, Admiral Attach, for your pleasant uh, words for, for me and for the Chamber of Shipping. Dear participants, I'm very pleased to be with you today. And it's a great pleasure for me to attend this Black Sea Maritime Conference. As is very well known, Black Sea has great impact on history biodiversity and security of six countries. Therefore, when we mention the name of Black Sea, we somehow recognize the enormous strategic importance of it over the centuries. After the 11th century, the Black Sea witnessed the settlement of various Turkish tribes from both the North and the South. The arrival of the Turks in Anatolia after the Battle of Malaske led to new developments in the Southern coasts. Continuously, in the middle and, and west of the Anatolian coast of the Black Sea, new Turkish principalities emerged, except the Greek state of Trabzon. The Mongol expansion was more effective in the northern steppes, and the main contact between west and east was re-established in the 13th century by the Turks. The area kept its such situation until the Ottomans came to change the ongoing history by the 15th century after the conquest of Istanbul. They were started to capture important commercial cities and control the whole area together with its shores for several hundred years. By the 16th century, all the Western Black Sea coast from the Crimea, Crimea to Istanbul came under the Ottoman rule. Under the Ottoman rule, the Black Sea witnessed an important commercial activity. The main center of the strait went, was Istanbul. It should be remembered that since ancient times, the Black Sea region had formed an intense economic unity with the Aegean and the Mediterranean. Just to name some commodities as subject to trade in the region, grain, meat, fish, and other animal products, fabrics made of silk, cotton, hemp. Russian merchants by the late 15th century and onwards came to ports such as Azak and Kefe more intensively and began to market their goods. The Russians then obtained a declaration from the Ottomans in order to be able to trade freely. As it was the case for known seas, hydro hydrographic explorations were also began in the Black Sea in the, in the 18th century by the Russian sailors. Such explorations continued by several navies and seamen throughout the 19th century. When time passes, investigations continued by neighboring countries in the 20th century. The area also known for shipbuilding facilities. For instance, until the beginning of the 18th century, there were 44 shipyards all over the Black Sea coast for Ottomans. Dear guests, as the chairman of the Chamber of Shipping, I would like to end my speech here and leave the deep and fruitful discussions to the historians and uh, you, the specialists. I sincerely hope your very valuable results, comments, and recommendations will be very helpful to the maritime people and the firms. Thank you for your cooperation. Dear Mr. Kran, thank you very much for your historical explanation. Uh, now it is time to end the opening remarks. And before inviting our keynote speaker, please let me provide a brief introduction. Uh, even though Admiral Metina Taj already uh, informed you, but I would like to read uh, as he has many uh, uh, titles. <laughs> Professor Dr. Posnikov is director of Imago Mundi International Journal on the History of Cartography. Honorable Scientist of the Russian Federation, Honorable Member of the Russian Geographical Society, Academician at International Academy of the History of Science, Corresponding Member of European Academy of Sciences, Chief Research Fellow, Former Director of SI Vavilov Institute of History of Science and Technology. I kindly invite Professor Dr. Alexei Postnikov 
to deliver us his speech on Slavs, on the Black Sea in the early Middle Ages. Dear Professor, are you here? Dr. Songu, I guess he is not available at the moment. We can just wait for some time. If he shows up, we can start with him. Otherwise, we can proceed with the next, next speaker. Okay, we will. We can wait. He knows actually. I just saw him, but I can't see him right now. He he might have been disconnected. Mm -hmm. Let's give him some time. Yes. We do that, but in the meantime, I would like to inform you. Uh, um, okay, I would like to inform you about the coming session. Uh, if there is some problem that we cannot reconnect to our keynote speaker, if our first speakers are here, we can move on maybe the first with the first session. Uh, please let me give a brief introduction about the session until the, our keynote speaker comes. Uh, in the first uh, session, we will be listening Professor Dr. Naira Tabitze, Associated Professor Dr. George Gabedeva, Lecturer Mehmet Yahşi, Lecturer Selahattin Alp Erkurtulmuş, and PhD candidate Emir Yener. Each participant uh, in this session will be having 20 minutes and uh, a notification will be sent when there is two minutes left. Uh, after all presentations completed, there will be time for questions and answers. Uh, therefore, I would like to remind you, dear guests, that in order to ask the question, please uh, write your question in the chat box and we will direct your question to the person you wish to ask. Uh, we actually uh, ask you write your questions on the chat box with your name and surname and the participant to whom you wish to ask your question. Um, and please uh, be keep uh, your question with the topics presented. Uh, now, maybe if uh, Professor Dr. Naira Tabitza and Associated Professor George Gabedeva are here, we can move on with our first presentation. If you are ready, can we move on? Professor George Gabedeva, do you hear me? Uh, please open your voice. Um, okay, I think there is some problem about the, um, uh, we will start, let's say, I see that Professor Dr. George Gabedeva is ready. Um, the paper of Professor Dr. Naira Tabitze and Associated Professor Dr. George Gabedeva are from Batumi Navigation Teaching University. They send their paper to us and their presentation title is the connection of the noble brothers with Ajera region and the development of oil industry. Uh, now maybe we can hear you. Uh, Dr. Songu, he is writing that Zoom does not allow him to unmute. So please, the moderator, could you please Unmute George, Mr. George Gabedala. Okay, uh, now we can hear you, I think. Yes, can okay. you hear me? Okay, thank you very much. Thank and you. maybe uh, if it's possible, my colleague also is unmuted or not? <clears throat> Naira, Mrs. Naira is unmuted. Good morning, dear colleagues, dear participants, and guests. I am Naira Tabize, professor of the Batumi Navigation Teaching University. Me together with my colleague, George Gabedava, present our work on the topic, the Nobel Brothers and Batumi. I am glad participate in such a forum and I wish 
success to the event. So please, can you unmute me? Dear Professor, is there something wrong? So, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you unmute my uh, account? Because we are together, Mrs. Snyder. Okay. Now I got notification. <laughs> so, sorry for this uh, technical problem. I don't know what's happening with Zoom. Uh, I was not able to unmute myself. And uh, let me introduce first myself. I am George Kabedawa, Associate Professor of the Batumi Navigation Teaching University. And uh, as Mrs. Naira mentioned, uh, me and Mrs. Naira uh, prepared the uh, article for this uh, symposium. And it's our pleasure to participate in this uh, great event. Let me share a uh, presentation and I know that we are limited in time and I will be very brief and quick. <laughs> but uh, also I need permission from admin to share a uh, presentation, if admin will help me. So can a uh, host help me to give me access to share my screen? Uh, he just called me, he's trying to do it, but I think there is a problem. We didn't understand what's happening. So uh, Zoom has limitation from the host uh, on this uh, action because the guest is not allowed to share screen. I see my, hello, this is Tom McCran speaking. I see myself as host. I don't know why and how I became the host. So uh, the real host, could, could the real host, uh, you know, change that, please? So that, uh, you know, the, the real host, host becomes the, the host. Even maybe, and, Mrs. Fundak, you can yes, allow uh, me because you are co-host. Yes, Mr. Kran, I am just checking it. I have no idea how I became the host. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, of course, no, not your uh, right. fault. Because of you, no. Um, okay.
Samer Bey sizden rica etsem e, Puru Admin'i tekrar host yapar mısınız? Size geçmiş hostluk bir şekilde. Funda Hanım kimi host yapıyorum? E, PRU Admin yazıyor Tamer Bey. PRU Admin, PRU Admin. Aşağıya doğru. Evet, tamam. Chat, make host, tamam. Evet, evet. Okey. Çok teşekkürler, sağ olun. Rica ederim, sağ olun. Ya, benden kaynaklanmadı bak söylüyorum. Doğru, kesinlikle. <gülüyor> kesinlikle biz bir atlama tamam. olması olduysa çok sağ olun Tamer Bey. Tamam. Yes. Uh, there was a problem about technical issues. Somehow Mr. Kran became host of the symposium. Now uh, admin took it back. I think now you can share the screen. We are yes, yes, yes. Now uh, I can. Yes. I hope you. that all of you see my screen. Yes. And sorry for this uh, technical sorry. problem. Sometimes yeah. happens when we work in this format. It's exactly. like a normal. Uh, uh, uh cases sometimes so uh as we mentioned our uh topic for today uh, symposium is the the connection of the noble brothers with the Jara region and the development of oil industry and the main keywords uh, on which we will be focused during our presentation is the noble brothers and their activities in uh, uh specifically in georgia and Batumi oil industry and the ajara region there has always been and will always be a confirmation between the world's leading states regarding expansion and maintenance of cultural or economic influences. The Caucasus is one of the most strategic region, regions in world geopolitics and in the Caucasus, Batumi is a place of co concentration of modern maritime, land-based and energy resources. The role of Batumi and its worthness is acknowledged from olden times. According to the ancient Greeks of Romans and Caucasus is the boundary between civilized and barbaric worlds. At the turn of the 19th centuries, the history of noble brothers and Swedish companies in Georgia begins. The noble era was timed and several new discoveries we are made every millennium and along with the advancement of technology Humanity was also advancing with taking gains leaps. The steam engine, the railroad and submarine, the wireless telegraph and the photography, the car, even the cinema are all 19th century achievements. Talented and enterprising people, we are high, highly valued in this era. It was Immanuel Nobel who due to bankruptcy in Sweden, moved to Russia in 1942 namely to St. Petersburg. Thanks to his inventive talent and energy, he got involved in the military industry and soon established his own uh, workshop called Noble and Sons. Immanuel Noble has always emphasized the talent and ambitiousness of his eldest son, Alfred. In 1950, 17 years old, Alfred traveled to America and Europe to study advanced technologies. In Paris, he worked for a year in the laboratory and Ternopolis, Chiruza, we had 10 years early in a substance, nitroglycerin was discovered by combination of nitric acid and sulfur acid. It was the use of these substances for his own purpose that became the lifetime project of Alfred Nobel, and the main source of his fortune. Nitroglycerin itself, however, remained difficult to transport and extremely dangerous to handle. So dangerous, in fact, that Nobel's nitroglycerin factory blew up in 1964, kill, uh, killing his younger brother, Emil, and several other people. Undaunted by this tragic accident, 
Nobel started a long process of experiments, which Nobel called nitro nitroglycerin taming. Uh, Nobel brothers had a house and a land plot near Batumi. The house survives to this day, and now it is Nobel brothers Batumi Technological Museum. They exhibit items, tell us about the activities of nobles, and they are related to the development of technologies in Batumi and its establishment as a port city. Gorgio's house in Batumi, besides the river and the mountains, near the sea with large horse tables, a sailing painted with carpets and a fireplace covered with precious marble. Is the noble summer residence as this house was described in 1988. Uh, the noble brothers we are involved in many activities. They decided to export Caspian hydrocarbons to Europe several options of transit routes we are discussing they agreed on the route chosen by Ludwig, Baku, Tiflis, Batumi, and it was the collision of interest of gains of the financial world, nobles, Rothschilds, and Lockferrells. The battle of these three families has gone down in history as the so-called 30 years war, the cause of it all, the Transcaucasian Railway and oil. The photo is uh, on the um, presentation is uh, taken in Batumi uh, and uh, describes the place where the noble settlement were. Yes. And uh, the uh, Georgian uh, National Airship have a number of interesting documents concerning the nobles and their activities in Georgia. One of them attests to how in March 1973, Robert addressed the local authorities in Tbilisi, presuming them as to the benefit of the newly invented dynamic for the constructing railroads, clearing rocky regions and underwater. Moreover, he asked for permission to import 500 pounds of dynamic to the Caucasus on a tax-free basis. Also, Robert was the first of the nobles to visit the Caucasus. It was not him, but Ludwig, who eventually became the founder of the Russian oil industry. In 1975, the boat in Baku, a kerosene plant and oil rich territories for 8,000 rubles from Tiflis society. In May 1978, by the special imperial degree of the Alexander II, the petroleum production company Nobel Brothers Limited was formed, known as a brand Nobel, with an initial capital fund of 3 million rubles. The photo uh, given on the slide is taken at the local museum of Batumi, and uh, the um, oil in these uh, bottles are uh, first samples taken by the nobles in Batumi, and it is uh, protected at the local museum in Batumi. During uh, the 1990s, the nobles transported oil and kerosene from Baku to Europe as a wire small Georgian city of Koti or through the Baltic Sea ports. Using these routes involved huge financial costs and therefore oil industrialists sought a new, much cheaper way. The completion of the Batumi Santradia Railway in 1993 connected Batumi directly to Baku, considerably increasing the city's industrial and export growth prospects. The Berlin Peace Congress of 1978 also contributed to this process by declaring Batumi as a Batumi a Porto Franco free port, so-called. Uh, nobles, Rothschilds, and German and English investments flowed into the city. Due to this geographical and strategic location, Batumi was the cause of four Russo-Turkish wars in the 19th century, as it was one of the best port on the Black Sea, and Mikhail Voronso wrote about it in 1953, the small port of Batumi is rightly considered to be one of the best large merchant ships can take refuge in it in case of any wind. The small port of Batumi is the best of the Black Sea. And uh, main important is the fact what the, uh, Ludwig wrote his brothers 
Alfred and Rob Robert about Batumi. Uh, in consideration of all the above, it was not in the direct interest of nobles to build a bypass road by the uh, but to export this raw material directly to Europe via Batumi. And Ludwig wrote from Baku to his brothers, Alfred and Robert, in Petersburg, from all the roads available for oil transportation from Baku, I recommend choosing the one for Georgia because of the friendships and mutual loyalty that has existed between the Georgians and Azeris for centuries. For us foreigners, this factor is of the considerable importance since all other roads involve much more danger and because there are so no such variable conditions elsewhere expect from both Baku and Tbilisi. I'm sure that we should choose exactly this route. Finally, it was agreed to export hydrocarbons to Europe according to his plan on the Baku Tbilisi Batumi Railway for the completion of which the necessary 10 million US dollars we are provided by the Rothschilds who also distributed small credits for the creation of oil refineries in Batumi. Uh, after construction of the Baku Batumi Railway and the reconstruction of the port and the connection of the pipeline with Baku, Batumi became an important port, important port on the Black Sea coast. From we have the Caspian Sea oil products we exported in to other countries. Batumi has become an industrial city. The oil companies of Rothschild, Nobel, uh, Mantashev, Nurkdor dominated. The rich Nair factory was built in 1984 and Zimmerman factory in 1888, existed at, until 1950. In 1908, Batumi ranked third in the Russian Empire after the ports of St. Petersburg and Odessa, according to the cargo, cargo turnover. At the beginning of 20th century, Batumi was a port of international importance and hosted many foreign ships, including many German merchant ships. By this time, Batumi was already a large city with paved streets, power station, water supply systems, schools, hospitals, post office, banks, and so on. There was a closed market in Nuria Square. More than half of the population of Batumi consisted of young workers from the villages of Guria, Emirati, Samegrelo, and Ajara, and other regions of the country as well. So let me uh, uh, talk a little bit about the um, prizes, Nobel Prizes and laureates in Georgia. The first Nobel Prize ceremony uh, um, was held in Stockholm in 1991, five years after the death of its founder. And in the beginning, we had the six nominations uh, in this regard. They were Diploma, Gold Medal, and Cash Prize for achievements in literature, chemistry, physics, psychology, and medicine, as well as for outstanding contributions to world peace. Since 1969, economic science had been added to the list. Nobel first included ma mathematicians in the list, but then removed and included the Peace Prize instead. Up to 35 Nobel Prize winners have visited Georgia at different times. It is obvious that hosting a laureate after being awarded the Nobel Prize is crucial for the country. We have the 15 such cases and other physicists, writers, or public figures visited different cities of Georgia at different times before receiving the award. And uh, this lady on the photo, Berta von Santner, was uh, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1905. She was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize. It is believed that she was a major influence on Nabel's decision to include the Peace Prize among those prizes provided in his will. And uh, to conclude, we can say that the Nobel Brothers have made a great contribution to the development of the Black Sea region, in particular to the pipeline transport of Georgia, which in turn facilitated the entry of civilization in the region at the early stage. The establishment of an oil terminal in Batumi since 1993 has been of strategic importance 
for the country. It has become the gate of Europe on the Black Sea, and we are telling the world today about the connection of the Nobel with Georgia. Thank you very much for listening. And after that, if some of you will have questions, we are ready to reply. Dear Thanks. Professor, dear Professor, thank you very much for your presentation. All questions and answers will be asked and replied at the end of the session. Uh, so we can, if uh, the professors are here, we can go on with our second uh, presentations. Um, now I would like to call our second speakers, lecturer Mehmet Yahşi and lecturer Selahattin Alp Erkurtulmuş from Yalova University. Their presentation is about lighthouses and their study titled as Silent Witnesses of the Sea Lights, Black Sea Lighthouses. We can start if you are ready, professors. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I would like to thank you uh, for this symposium. Thank you. I would appreciate as a participant. I will start the mic. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it was on the scene. Yes. Yes. Uh, our paper is Silent Witness of the Sea Lights, Plexi uh, Lighthouse. Uh, I am the lecturer of. Yellow University Mehmet Yashi at the second writer is lecturer Selatin Erkutumuş. We are working in Altınova Vocational High School. In this paper, our aim and scope is lighthouses, one of the most important navigational case of the ships, is the main theme of the study. The aim of the study is the emphasis the importance of the lighthouses in terms of both Black Sea story and to touch on the past of the Black Sea lighthouses, which are the silent and unknown witnesses of history. The paper goes like three steps. First step is brief history of lighthouses. Second is important lighthouses on the Black Sea coast. And third is the result and finish. Firstly, it's known that the historical development process lighthouses first emerged from a need for security with the emergence of fishing. The relatives of fishermen who were hunting would light a fire to help them to return in the dark, and a watch was kept by this fire. Fires were usually lit on the high points of promontory protruding from the land of the sea, just like in the lighthouses. For this reason, attention was paid to the height of the fireplace above the sea level. Lighthouses were widely used by sailors and date back to the 4th century BC. It is the oldest navigational aid serving sailors since the 6th century. The location and characteristic of the lighthouses place it in suitable places on the coast where they should be are shown on the navigation map. The tradition of helping sailors guide the way with fires with that critical points at night was later made more permanent, useful and featured with lighthouses. In this scene, lighthouses structures represent one of the greatest contribution to maritime fire. The lighthouses which help the ships to navigate with their tower in daytime 
and their light and night, having served the maritime field for many years. During the sea voyage, headlands, rocks, houses, lighthouses, floating navigation signs, islands, etc. This factor is important for the safe of navigation of ships and for the health determination of their position. Lighthouses are also known as navigation sign made to guide ships and determine their position. They can be classified in two ways as the coastal or sea lighthouses according to their location. Coastal lighthouses, coastal lighthouses are built in coastal area, cape, island, etc. are located on land masses. The best example of the are Aharkapı, Babakale, and Rumeli Burnu lighthouses. Sea lighthouses are lighthouses intertwined with the sea, shallow, rocky, etc. are made in the sea areas, Silivartona, Unchained, Pelican, Lantern, etc. can be cited as an example of this time. It is known that all the slaughterhouses in the world was built in Kumkalia, located in the south of Chanakkale, in Sigium, under the name of the Roman period. According to another date, the first light tower mentioned in written historical source in BC, it is said that the Alexandra lighter was built in 280 BC on the Faroe Island in the Egyptian port city of Alexandra. It is known that there were imperial lighthouses similar to the lighthouses of Alexandra in the Roman period BC. It is stated in historical source that around third imperial lighthouses were built in the area from the Black Sea to the Atlantic Ocean in the fifth century. In the Middle Age, political, cultural, and commercial turmoil caused a decline in maritime as well as in many other areas. And there, uh, there was a stagnation in lighthouse construction. For this reason, those who sailed at night could only benefit from lights in the watch towers of monasteries and castles near the coast instead of lighthouse. It is seen that early period lighthouses were still used in the Zeitung period. Main sources of lighthouses in the 1823, Elgas, oil in the 1870s, acetylene in 1896 and incandescent mineral oil burner from 1898 were also used. Since the end of the 9th century, light has been obtained by using electrical energy. Acetyl gas, which provides a brighter light source in Ottoman lighthouses, started to be used in 1903. With the use of gas, it has made it possible to switch from fixed lighting to stroke lighting. Acetylene, on the other hand, provided rapid and sharp lighting. The reflectors that allow the reflection of the light in the lighthouse were first encountered in 1786. Although highly advanced technologies have been produced in the field of maritime today, lighthouses have not lost their effectiveness. Therefore, lighthouses should be structures that need to be protected. In addition, it should be a social sharing area that should be more integrated with the city, not only a navigation lane, but also as a sociocultural space. One of the best examples in this regard is the Aharkapı Lighthouse. One of the oldest lighthouses of the Ottoman Empire, an exhibition hall, a lighthouse library, a restaurant, cafeteria, and gift shop 
were opened that and the lighthouse which was a uh, bearing eight was also transformed to into a social sharing area the first lighthouse which is considered to be built during the long -term of, uh, ottoman empire is fenerbahce lighthouse which was built by Suleiman the Magnificent in 1562. This lighthouse is shown on the maps of Istanbul belonging to the 15th and 16th centuries in the copies of Kitabi Bahriya and in Jihanname. It is possible to, to find the explanation for the fact that an Ottoman lighthouse was not built until in 6th century in the Ottoman Empire's view of the sea and actual station in the seas in the period, until Fatih Sultan Mehmet. Because until the end of the 5th century, the Latins had a stronger naval power than the Ottoman Empire. And the situation can be understood if the fact that the owners of the trade colonies in the Black Sea and Asia were also Latins until the conquer. Another lighthouse with the oldest name, other than the lighthouse in Fenerbahce, is the Romali Feneri. The name of Romali Feneri is included in the Black Sea map in the Atlas, which is known to have been prepared by Ali Major Reis in 1568. It is known that the location of Romali Feneri has always preserved its importance throughout history. It has been recorded that centuries ago, this location was called the Victoria Temple of Pies, which was considered sacred by the sailors and at this point of the Bosphorus. Lighthouses were lit on the high towers guiding the ships, just like on the Antolian coast. The height of the tower is very important, as are the light source in terms of marking and inform the sailors. According to the first date, the lighthouses with the highest height from the ground were Romoli Lighthouse with 30 meters, our couple lighthouse with 29 meters, Memachik Burno Lighthouse with 25 meters, Hoshkar Lighthouse with 22 meters, Panarbacha Lighthouse with 20 meters, and Shira Lighthouse with 90 meters. With the work carried out in the following years, the arc of the lighthouse was increased to 36 meters and Shira Lighthouse to 60 meters. Those Shira Lighthouse become the largest, largest lighthouse in the city. Yes, we are passing to second section. Black Sea Lighthouse. The Black Sea Lighthouses that are under protection as a national heritage by the Directorate General of Coastal Safety are as follows. First lighthouse is Inada Lighthouse. Located in Limankiri for kilometers away from Inada town. On the slope of the 50 or 60 meters from the sea, the historical lighthouse is the westernmost lighthouse of the Black Sea, the lighthouse which was built by French in uh, 1866 during the region of Sultan Abdul Majid, is also known as a French lighthouse among the people. It consists of a rectangular administrative building and psychological lighthouse. The lighthouse, which was installed with the crown and illuminated that the sea with Khorasan when there was no electrical installation. Can be seen even from 20 miles away, thanks to 100 halogen bulbs and plastic reflectors. Apart from the lighthouse located on a very widely promontory and ejected lighthouse, well, there are fields, 
uh, white fig trees and behind it summer villas that watch the black sea panorama with the lighthouse the height of the lighthouse is 44 meters from the sea at the tower is uh, eight meters second lighthouse is rumeli Karabrun lighthouse the lighthouse which is served by rumeli Karabrun rescue station is located at the tip of the old castle of Karabrun. The lighthouse is the third most powerful lighthouse in the world in terms of light power. Crystal lens were used to reflect the light power of the lighthouse into distance. The reflection of the crystal, mir crystal mirrors, 24 pieces, and the ceiling in the side facades are gathering in middle lens, resulting in strong lights. It is known as the lighthouse with the longest reach in Turkey after the Shira Lighthouse. Rainwater was on the side of the original chopper dam of decorated with lion heads. In rainy weather, the water that accumulates on the eave flows down the open mounts of the line. The crystals are covered with a cover so that the lens are not damaged by sunlight reflection during the day. The high of the lighthouse is 54 meters from the sea and the high of the tower is 12 meters. The strobe light has a 15 miles distance view. If a ship stranded on the shallow ground in bad condition after the rock style rock was thrown over the ship and tied, the passengers were rescued by cable car system. At the foot of the lighthouse toward to the sea, there is a cemetery of orphans surrounded by wire mesh. Unknown, unclaimed corpus that came out to sea throughout history had been buried here. Although the cave where the lighthouse is located was more advanced in previous years, the rocks blasted with dynamite for the construction of harbors were taken from here and used. Those who look from the shore towards the lighthouse or down from the lighthouse can see a rest at part of promontory. And third lighthouse is Shile Lighthouse. Shile Lighthouse was built in 1859 by the lighthouse administration as a route lighters for the ship's navigation of Black Sea Coast. As a result of the consensus given to French during the Ottomans, thick stone tower, the height of the octagonal tower of the lighthouse is 19 meters. The tower is painted in black and white horizontal bands so that it can be seen well in daytime. The knocking character uh, Flashing white 50 seconds, the visible distance of the lighthouse is 20 nautical miles. A weak kerosene lamp was used as the light source in the lighthouses, then bright illuminated sleeve lamps working with LPG were using, and currently it is illuminated with a 1000 watt electric lamp. In order to straighten the light source and make it visible from afar, six cathodrophic panels with a focal length of 925 millimeter are used. The optical panel in question are placed in an octagonal form and a rotating circular platform over the mercury bar. The light source is a lit steadily and focus and by rotating an optical panels on the platform, the lighthouse is provided with stop lights. It was weighted that move vertically down with steel wires in the tower while the white is descending. The clock starts to move and if the weight is not set back up the way, the clock stops when the weight reaches the bottom. The lighthouse keepers were winning lighthouse optical clock 
with the white crown attached to the mechanism just below the optical system. The system is similar to the clock mechanism in homes. The safe machinery and optical panels have been taken under protection and play. The system has been modernized and in the lighthouse and has been made operational with a geared electric motor and photocell system in Shiller Lighthouse. Next lighthouse is Zongulduk Lighthouse. Zongulduk Lighthouse, which was built in 1908, is located on the Black Sea coast on a promontory 53 meters above the sea level in Zongulduk province, working with electricity since 1985. The light of uh, 500 watts emanating from its nine meter high tower can be seen from uh, 20 nautical miles away. The lighthouse is a single story masonry building. Its roof is in the form of a pitot roof and covered with Marcellus tiles. A single entrance to the T-shaped building is provided from the front. On the right side of the entrance, there is a section and the hall is used a toilet and bathroom. There is a long narrow corridor extending to the interior of the building and all rooms and kitchen open to this corridor. At the end of the corridor, there is a separate staircase leading to the lighthouse located adjacent and building in questions. Access to the tower is via this concrete staircase. Again, in this concrete stairway, here is a uh, mechanism to light the lighthouse. Kerempe Lighthouse. It was established on 1 May 1885 as a route light for the ship navigation on Black Sea caused by Ottoman lighthouses as an administration. As a 15 miles white light with a head of 95 meters in 1937. The fog whistle station was added to lighthouse and put into operation. Kerempa lighthouse is eight meters above the ground and 82 meters above the sea. The characters of the lighthouse is flashing white 20 seconds and it serves as a burning period Heavy chorus and lamp was used as a light source in the lighthouse, then bright illuminated sleeve lamp working with LPG were used and it is currently illuminated with a 500 electric lamp. The focal light is 500 millimeter to straighten the light source and make it visible from afar. Uh, for but of the optic panels are used. Side optical panels are placed on the rotating circular platform on the ball bearing and rectangle form. The light source is lit steadily in focus and by rotating the optical panels on the platform. The lighthouse is provided with strobe lights and wind up revelation machine is used to rotate the panels and machine, which is the equivalent of the clock machine, is installed and operated with that vertical drive in the the safe machine and optical panels have been taken under protection and are still usable on uh, 1 May 206. The system was modernized in the lighthouse and it was made operational with a geared electrical motor and photosub system. Sinop in Jebron Lighthouse. It is the northest, it is the northernmost lighthouse in Turkey. Located on the Cape, located approximately 20 kilometers northwest of the center of Sinop in the Black Sea region. It was built in 1863. Visible distance is 70 meters. It is nine meters above the ground and 
26 meters above the sea level. Bafra Lighthouse. It was built in Halisburn location on the delta where Kızılırmak empties into the sea by French contractors in 1880 during the Ottoman Empire period. It is very important route lighters for ship navigating in this location in the Black Sea. Due to the data of the land on which is located, it was built by driving iron pipe piles. It was built a completely steel construction with steel frame profiles around 22 meter cylindrical steel tower. The tower of the lighthouse is 25 meters above the sea level and the tower head is 22 meters. The visible distance of the lighthouses, 20 nautical miles. It has weights that move vertical down with steel wires in the tower. While the weight is the scanning, the clock starts to move. And if the weight is not set back up the way, the clock stops when the weight reaches the bottom. The lighthouse keepers were winning the lighthouse optical clock with the white chrome attached to the mechanism just below the optical system. This system is similar to the clock mechanism. As we are coming to last section results, evaluation and conservation of lighthouses cannot be confined to only the lighthouse structures themselves. In order to understand the meaning and importance of the lighthouse, one has to interpret the complex relationships between lighthouses, their close and distant environments, service providers, and users, not only at a specific moment in time, but over the centuries. Thus, any conservation proposal must regard the relationship of the lighthouse to the maritime routes it is inherently tied with as well as the other cultural heritage nearby. As the lighthouse had been automatic, the keepers uh, had been taken out of the lighthouses and put into urban branch office. Yet the keepers did not only watch out the light, but they also maintained the and clean the facilities. In many distances, the keepers had been the first to respond to nearby vessel and travel. The technology had reached lighters first in the furthest location in Turkey. First radio, first television had become an attraction for the local villages. Those lighters had operated like a town hall. For those who wanted to see the technology and receive the latest need, due to the departure of keepers from the sea, the buildings had fallen into social, social issue and evidenced by several visual. The social relation of the lighthouses with their surroundings is also damaged. Lighthouse keeping continues from father to son or mother to daughter. Leaving the maintenance solely to the technician is a treat for this profession. At last, one central lighthouse can be chosen for specific areas to accommodate keepers on seat. This solution may be the most economical and healthy passive conservation method in the long run. Lighthouses in Turkey is important part of Turkish maritime heritage and a cultural group within the broader family of Turkey, Turkish cultural heritage. This heritage is the outcome of cultural, commercial, traditional, religious, military, and political relationships had been formed over centuries and local, regional, and global scale. In this respect, the conservation of lighthouse and maiden heritage is a Crucial for a comparison and inclusive representation of Turkish culture and future. 
I would love to say thank you for my presentation. Yes. I will close my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, dear Mr. Yashi, thank you very much for your presentation and for your paper that you prepared with together with Mr. Arkurtulmuş. Thank you again. Now I would like to invite our third speaker in this session, uh, Mr. Emir Yener. He will be delivering his research titled as Battles of the Dinya Perliman and the Fate of the Black Sea, 1787-1788. Uh, Mr. Emir Yener, if you are here and if you are ready. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. And you can see me also, right? Okay, okay perfect. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like I would like to apologize for being a little bit late. I, I was trying to deal with uh, this unnatural way of uh, way of uh, giving a speech. Uh, so uh, my name is Emir Yener, and uh, I participate from uh, Istanbul. I am a, a maritime historian uh, and a PhD candidate. Uh, so uh, in uh, today uh, in my presentation, I would like to talk about a largely forgotten uh, chapter of maritime, Rosso uh, Ottoman maritime history, which actually was one of the most decisive moments uh, in the history of both Black Sea and also in the history of the both Ottoman and Russian empires. Uh, this chapter is the Battle of the Dnieper Liman or the Battle of the Dnieper Estuary, uh, in, uh, which con uh, continued for actually for two years. Uh, a campaign which continued for two years from uh, 1787 to 1788. And uh, it decided uh, the mastery, the question about the mastery of the Black Sea. Uh, it was the most decisive battle, uh, the most decisive uh, military and also the most decisive military campaign uh, during the during Catherine the Great's uh, two Russo Turkish wars and probably in the whole history of the uh, Russo Turkish wars. Uh, and uh, after the after the Battle of the Dnieper Liman, uh, Russia became uh, the almost undisputed master of the Black Sea. The era of the Ottoman uh, domination over the Black Sea ended. And the Black Sea became uh, a full part of the international uh, maritime, uh, international maritime uh, space, international maritime history. So, uh, first of all, uh, why this battle uh, is important? For uh, apart from the decisive, apart from the decisive aspect uh, of the battle. It is also important uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, of our understanding of the naval power itself, uh, especially the naval power in 18th century and in the age of sail. Uh, as uh, merit, as the maritime historians are aware, uh, the uh, maritime power uh, in the 18th century is understood and continues largely to be understood. Uh, under the shadow, under the long shadow of the American theorist uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan, what Mahan had said, he had uh, he had formulated that the key to global uh, and uh, re regional global any type of uh, maritime uh, maritime power is the battle fleet, open seas battle fleet, and uh, uh, the the fate of the maritime uh, both maritime nations. Uh, maritime empires are decided uh, with a clash of the battle fleets, pure uh, of the pure uh, warships on the open seas, and he relegated the land forces into largely into uh, second plan. However, uh, ever 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 since uh, the British, uh, the rival British theorist uh, Sir Julian Corbett, uh, Mayhans uh, Mayhans uh, formulations. Uh, uh, are uh, put into question, are uh, are questioned and are opposed. Uh, but uh, in the second half of the 20th century, Mayhan had become again uh, the dominant, uh, again the dominant theorist and the dominant theory. Uh, 
mechanism became the dominant theory uh, in terms of maritime uh, in understanding the naval power uh, maritime power uh, in history but uh, the naval history of the eastern mediterranean the levantine region and especially in my case uh, the battle of dnieper liman uh, puts a uh, puts a great challenge uh, again uh, to the mechanist uh, dogma and helps us to understand better what kind of uh, role na naval power pl uh, played in the clash of ba basically land-based, uh, of uh, fundamental land-based uh, Eurasian empires. Uh, in our case, the Russian and Ottoman uh, Empire. So, uh, speaking of the origins of the campaign, the campaign uh, was part of uh, the campaign was part of a, uh, of uh, Catherine the Great's uh, wars against the Ottoman Empire. Now, uh, Catherine the Great's, the Great's uh, war, two wars with the Ottoman Empire, uh, are uh, actually uh, uh, are actually the crucible from uh, which the modern Eastern Europe, uh, in general, and about especially the modern Balkans, uh, emerged. Uh, both uh, modern Poland, modern Ukraine, uh, modern Balkan countries have all their uh, fundamental roots uh, in the outcomes of uh, Catherine the Great's two Tur Turkish wars with the Ottoman Empire. As uh, interestingly enough, uh, the na naval power and uh, navy's fleets played a very decisive role in both wars. Uh, uh, there were two wars, by the way. Uh, the first one is the more famous one, probably from which continued from 1768 to 1775 uh, and uh, ended with the tremendous Russian victory and with the Treaty of Küçük Kaynarca. Uh, and the second war continued from 1787 to 1791. The most famous naval engagement uh, in the, in this, uh, in Catherine the Great Turkish Wars is undoubtedly the Battle of Çeşme, the Çeşme in 1770. And the Battle of Çeşme, ever since, ever even since the battle itself happened, is uh, celebrated in, especially in Russian historiography, uh, as the decisive moment when Russia saved naval superiority against Ottoman Empire, uh, against its Turkish rival. And uh, interestingly, the Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman Turkish uh, historical tradition also, but especially the modern Turkish uh, naval tradition also takes this. Russian point of view, and accepts the Battle of Çeşme as a Turkish point, as a the decisive turning point. However, uh, I oppose this. Why? Uh, first of all, uh, the Battle of Çeşme uh, didn't have any lasting impact uh, on the balance of power between the two empires. Uh, yes, the, uh, and uh, it, the battle itself is very, uh, unfortunately, even in the 250 years, was very badly researched. And a lot of things are completely wrong. A lot of things which are told about the uh, Cheshme and Russian expedition to Mediterranean are completely wrong. Uh, but uh, to make long story short, uh, because the Russian Navy, uh, because the Russian expeditionary force uh, to Aegean uh, didn't have any, uh, uh, any land force, any credible land force, they could not uh, hurt Ottoman war effort uh, any, uh, in any meaningful way. Uh, basically, uh, the victorious uh, Russian uh, fleet uh, after Cheshma was only a nuisance. Uh, was, was only a nuisance uh, for the Ottoman Empire. The Catherine the Great's uh, uh, Russia won the first uh, Russo-Turkish War uh, on land uh, in in the battlefields of uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, in the battlefields of Ukraine and uh, in. Uh, uh, Moldavia uh, in, in the Balkans. However, uh, at the uh, the peace of Küçük Kaynarca, which ended the war, uh, actually pushed uh, the Russo-Ottoman frontier to, to the sea surface, basically. Uh, Ottoman Empire lost Crimea at the end of the war. Ottoman Empire lost Crimea. Uh, not actually lost, but Crimea was granted independence and uh, some uh, about uh, 10 years later, it was uh, incorporated, it was uh, annexed by the uh, Rus uh, Russian Empire, uh, and uh, which left uh, only 
one but e, extreme strategic point e, ot, e, at the Ottoman hands e, in terms of the domination over Black Sea. So uh, and uh, this uh, strategic point uh, was the fortress of Ochakov, or as the Ottomans called Özi, which is uh, today situated uh, of, uh, in, Ukra- in Ukraine. Uh, it's called it's called the town of Ocak- Ochakov today. The Ochakov is at the mouth of the Dnieper River. Uh, it actually controls uh, all shipping which comes and goes. Uh, from the uh, the Dnieper uh, River. And uh, in terms of the 18th century uh, ro- uh, Russia, the Dnieper River was an extremely critical, extremely vital uh, artery for commerce and for navigation. Uh, all uh, Russian uh, all Russian exports uh, uh, which were vital uh, which were vital for the Russian economy were conducted through the uh, Dnieper estuary and as long as the Ochakov at the fortress of Ochakov Özi was at the hands of the Ottoman Empire uh, Ottoman uh, Russian commerce was largely at the mercy of the Ottomans so as long as the uh, Och- uh, as long as Ochakov and uh, uh, the supporting castle of Hacı Bey which is today Odessa were at the Ottoman hands it it was not uh, possible to speak about a real uh, Russian uh, superiority in the Black Sea. The same was also true for uh, Caucasus. Uh, the fortress, uh, the fortress of Anapa uh, on the eastern eastern Black Sea, uh, was uh, the, the, was also severely restricting uh, uh, Russian uh, 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 Russian uh, 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 navigation and freedom of movement over the Black Sea. After the uh, after the uh, Treaty Peace of Küçük Kaynarca in 1774, uh, it was a huge trauma f- uh, for the Ottoman Empire. So uh, uh, why? Uh, because uh, it was the first time in Ottoman history when a majority Muslim uh, ma- when a majority Muslim population and the majority Muslim territory, uh, Crimea, was uh, taken away from Sultan's uh, domains. It was a huge legitimacy crisis, and uh, it caused a huge uh, economical and uh, refugee crisis. Uh, that there was a exodus of Crimean Tatars uh, from uh, Crimea after Russian annexation, uh, which strained uh, Russo-Ottoman relations uh, to the point of war. Uh, especially, uh, and uh, the, the tipping point came with uh, Catherine the Great's so-called Greek project. So what was the Greek project? Uh, Catherine the Great, uh, who was uh, Catherine the Great, who was uh, very much emboldened by its, her victory over the Ottoman Empire, was thinking that the Ottoman state was in an advanced state of decay and it could be easily uh, destroyed uh, with, an, uh, with a joint offensive from Balkans with Austria. Uh, so uh, Catherine uh, and uh, when the Catherine the Great's uh, when Catherine the Great's uh, designs over the Ottoman Empire became known in Istanbul, uh, it caused a huge uproar. Already the Ottoman elite, uh, who could not just accept the the, uh, the defeat and the Treaty of Küçük Kaynarca, were clamoring for a war of revenge against the against Russia. So Catherine the Great's aggressive uh, aggressive designs the Greek, the greek project uh, actually provided a boost uh, to the ottoman war party uh, the uh, the war hawk party uh, which was centered around the grand vizier uh, halil hamid pasha uh, and later yusuf pasha uh, in istanbul so uh, catherine the great uh, in uh, in the year 1787 uh, Catherine the Great uh, proceeded with a huge, uh, with a large army and a large uh, naval flotilla from Moscow uh, down to uh, down to the newly founded city of Kherson uh, uh, n- near Ochakov and uh, near the uh, Dnieper Liman, near the Dnieper Estuary, ostensibly for as a parade and as a inspection of the newly won Russian territories in the south. However, uh, 
Uh, it was also a uh, demonstration of raw power, of a uh, really crude, raw, undiplomatic raw power. Ottomans thought that uh, it was just uh, actually a ruse. Uh, it was a trick. And uh, this uh, inspection was just a lie. And Russians real, uh, because and because such a large army and uh, a, a large naval force was accompanying uh, Catherine the Great, they thought that it was actually just a, Uh, the Russians were preparing for a surprise attack uh, to to their territories, uh, either in Caucasus or in uh, or in uh, Balkans. Uh, so uh, in August uh, 1787, uh, Ottoman uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, gave an ultimatum uh, to the uh, gave a ultimatum to the uh, uh, to Catherine the Great and demanded the evacuation of Crimea. And naturally, when this uh, when uh, the Ottoman ultimatum was rejected, Ottoman Empire declared war. Ottoman declaration war was a surprise, uh, was a real surprise actually for for Catherine the Great. Uh, they were not, uh, yeah, a Russian uh, court was not expecting uh, an aggressive uh, Ottoman uh, an aggressive Ottoman movement uh, so, so soon, and the Russian forces were very unprepared. But uh, in return, uh, however, Ottoman forces were being modernized, uh, especially the Ottoman Navy was being you know, modernized and rebuilt since the Treaty of Küçük Kaynarca under the uh, under the guiding of Cezayir Ali Gazi Hasan Pasha. Uh, but however, it was still a very fragile. The Ottoman uh, war effort was still very fragile. Uh, and uh, everything depended on a very quick, quick Ottoman victory. There was also the Uh, truth. There was also the uh, danger that Austria, which were allied with uh, Russia, uh, would also soon uh, launch, uh, would soon declare war to Ottoman Empire and uh, attack from the Balkans. So everything on the Ottoman uh, part, everything depended on a, you know, lightning war, blitzkrieg style victory, and the, uh, this victory uh, were to be gained in Crimea. Ottoman war plan was. First, uh, amassing uh, forces, uh, land and uh, naval forces in Ochako, at Ochako, at the mouth of Dnieper Liman, and at Anapa. Uh, then uh, destroy, uh, then with the Ottoman Navy, by using the Ottoman Navy, destroy the new uh, Russian base at Nikolaev, and along with the Russian na naval forces there. And then... Uh, Landing uh, and landing an army to the southern Crimea and attacking at the same time uh, from uh, both Ochako and from Anapa uh, to the eastern and western Crimea. So it was a pincer. It was going to be a pincer moment, which was designed to uh, which was designed to overwhelm the unprepared Russian uh, defensive force, forces in Crimea. Uh, but uh, and what was the balance of power? So. Ottoman Navy at the start of the war possessed uh, about 32 uh, large uh, line of battleships and about 20 frigates and corvettes. Uh, about half of the Ottoman battleship, Ottoman large warships were uh, actually uh, over 60 guns or more. Russian Navy in return was much weaker. They possessed only uh, three uh, uh, line of battleships over. Uh, over 60 guns or more, uh, uh, and uh, uh, about uh, 14 uh, frigates and corvettes. But uh, Ottoman, uh, but Russian warships were more heavily built. They were more uh, durable than the than the li more lightly built Ottoman ships, and they were more heavily armed. So uh, Russians had a firepower advantage. Uh, but uh, the real difference was in the river flotillas, uh, because this was going to be an amphibious campaign. As uh, because uh, as most of the wars in Eastern Mediterranean, uh, so uh, the the major part was going to be played by uh, the river forces, the oared uh, ships. Ottomans had uh, quite a bit uh, uh, improved their river forces uh, with French help. So they possessed some 71 modern gunboats, gun bricks, uh, and uh, floating batteries. Against which the Russians had uh, about 60 uh, river, uh, ordered river ships. However, again, 
Russian ships were more heavily armed, and most importantly, they had better quality officers. Uh, the Ottoman Ottoman forces most uh, glaring weakness was uh, their uh, officer corps. Uh, Ottoman Ottomans didn't have any prof professional officers at the time, uh, but uh, Russians uh, ru and uh, uh, Ottoman training also uh, training and morale was also quite uh, brittle. Uh, but in contrast, Russian uh, of uh, Russian officer corps was uh, relatively well uh, uh, professionalized, and uh, Russian troops uh, possessed a better training, uh, better stamina than the Ottoman forces. So uh, the Battle of uh, the Dnieper Liman opened in uh, uh, in September 1787, and uh, until October, uh, the Ottoman Navy bombarded uh, the Kimbun uh, Forest, uh, the Kimbun Fortress. Uh, the Kimbun uh, Fortress was uh, was a uh, fortification, newly built fortification, right in uh, across the Dnieper Liman. Uh, on the eastern, uh, on the eastern, uh, sorry, on the western coast of Crimea, uh, on a thin strip of land uh, called the Kimbun Spit. So, the Kimbun Fortress commanded the southern uh, part of the Dnieper estuary. Ottomans needed to first conquer this uh, Kimbun Fortress, and then, uh, and only then they could move their forces uh, to destroy the Nikolaev uh, shipyard and the uh, bulk of the. Russian Black Sea Fleet, which was stationed there. However, uh, Russian uh, uh, Russian forces defending Kimburn uh, put up a very uh, spirited defense, especially uh, thanks to their legendary commander, Alexander Suvorov. Uh, Su Alexander Suvorov, who had the rank of general on chef at that moment, uh, uh, used his reserve forces uh, very cleverly and managed to beat up the main uh, Ottoman attack, which was launched from Ochakov, uh, in in at the end of at the end of September, according to the uh, new uh, calendar. Uh, and uh, Admiral, but uh, Russian naval forces didn't do that well. And actually, Admiral Mordvinov, who commanded the uh, river forces, which supported Suvorov, they actually lost uh, some ships against the Ot Ottoman navy. Uh, in the initial battles. And uh, with the onset of winter by no November, uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first part of the campaign closed. Uh, so the, the Ottoman Blitzkrieg, uh, the planned Ottoman Blitzkrieg had failed, clearly. Uh, uh, but uh, according to Ga uh, Cezayir Gazi Hasan Pasha, there was still a last chance uh, to implement the war plan and conquer Kimburn uh, next year, early next year, uh, in 1788. Ottomans even more reinforced uh, their navy and they recruited more troops. But Russians also, they re uh, moved reinforcements to, to the area. Uh, these reinforcements are about a 60,000 uh, strong army called the Yekaterinovstalskaya Army uh, under the command of uh, Prince uh, Grigory Potyomkin. Uh, the uh, the viceroy of southern Russia uh, and uh, Catherine the Great's favorite, uh, they uh, they started to uh, build uh, anti shipping uh, redoubts and uh, anti shipping uh, redoubts and uh, uh, redans uh, for small fortifications around uh, uh, the Dnieper estuary. Uh, so uh, the second phase of, uh, and uh, there. Uh, Austrians, uh, they also uh, declared war uh, to the Ottoman Empire in uh, February 1788. Uh, so uh, Ottomans had really only one chance before they had to deal with the Austrians uh, in the Balkans. Uh, they didn't have enough troops to deal with both Russia and Austria at the same time. So uh, the Battle of Dnieper, uh, second uh, part of the Battle of Dnieper Liman started in uh, May uh, 1788. When the Ottoman fleet of about 100 ships, uh, which were both large and small, they moved to the, to the Dnieper estuary. Uh, and uh, Hasan Pasha uh, tried to uh, first defeat the uh, Russian river forces, uh, def defending the approaches uh, to the, uh, the uh, Ochakov fortress. Uh, at this point, uh, Russian river forces also were quite reinforced, and Russians had the services of a 
very important name uh, Samuel Bentham. Uh, uh, Samuel Bentham was one of the most important uh, naval architects uh, of the 18th century, uh, he, uh, and he was the Brit. Uh, he was a Br British. Uh, br uh, he was British, and he was uh, the brother of the philosopher Jeremy Bentham. Uh, so uh, Samuel Bentham. During the winter, uh, during the preceding winter, uh, uh, Samuel Bentham had uh, reinforced the, uh, the Russian uh, river forces uh, around uh, the, uh, around Dnieper estuary with specially designed shallow draft ships armed with ex uh, extra heavy artillery, uh, and uh, he had manned uh, these ships with uh, soldiers from the Yekaterinovskaya army. Uh, so uh, when the battle was opened, uh, still uh, uh, Russia, uh, but, but Russia had one weakness: uh, the, the Russian sailing forces, uh, which were uh, commanded by the famous American, uh, Scottish American privateer, uh, the pirate, uh, and uh, who, who fought uh, for uh, American independence against Britain recently, John Paul Jones. And uh, their river forces, which were under the command of a German adventurer, Karl uh, von nassau Ligen. Uh, these two men, Jones and nassau Ligen, they were on very bad terms and they were not cooperating really with each other, which was greatly uh, harming uh, the Russian uh, command and control and uh, na uh, na naval effort. Uh, so, uh, uh, the uh, so uh, Ottomans uh, tried to uh, exploit this uh, lack of Russian coordination between uh, this lack of coordination between Russian forces, uh, and uh, they attacked first at the end of May. Uh, but uh, their attack uh, and they they had some success. They sank actually one large Russian gunboat. gunboat. Uh, but uh, ultimately, they didn't. Uh, Hasan Pasha didn't press on the attack, uh, but uh, he chose to uh, prepare better. And he uh, launched his main major thrust in the uh, at this uh, in uh, uh, twenty uh, in twenty eight uh, uh, sorry in, on the 25th of June uh, and this uh, Ottoman attack ended with a big disaster actually the biggest naval disaster in 18th century uh, Russians first uh, drew uh, the Ottoman ships into the shallow waters. Uh, into the shallow waters of the Dnieper Liman. And the Dnieper Liman, because Dnieper Liman is so shallow, it was not really suitable to float large uh, large ships with deep draft. Uh, but uh, Russians had uh, changed the markers uh, in, in the deep channels, uh, had, ch had the, the markers that the Turkish boats had stayed, uh, had put to guide the, uh, their large ships. Uh, Russians working at night uh, had uh, removed these markers and they uh, drew the Ottoman uh, ships into shallows. And, uh, as, a, uh, and as a result, uh, some large uh, Ottoman ships, including Hasan Pasha's own uh, flagship, was grounded uh, on the shallows. Uh, and uh, Russian light forces easily surrounded these grounded Ottoman ships uh, and burned them uh, with... Uh, with mo uh, Molotov cocktail like uh, incendiary bombs. Uh, for the, uh, when, the, when the Ottoman Navy uh, tried to retreat uh, into deep water, uh, some about eight more uh, large Ottoman ships grounded in the shallows, uh, and these were all uh, destroyed, or Ottomans had to destroy the, these themselves. And actually, uh, some of these uh, grounded Ottoman ships were captured by the Russian Navy. Uh, it is uh, uh, according to unfortunately we don't have casualty reports uh, from uh, Ottoman side, uh, but uh, according to Russian estimations, about uh, five thousand Ottoman sailors and soldiers had died or taken cap captive uh, dur uh, dur during the, this disaster uh, at the Dnieper estuary. Uh, it was almost half of the Ottoman. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was almost half of the Ottoman large force of the Ottoman large ships which participated to the campaign. Uh, uh, the, as, the net result, uh, and uh, as a result of this disaster, uh, as a 
uh, as a, as a, as a result of this disaster, uh, this uh, as a result of this disaster, uh, initiative passed to the Russians, and uh, Russians uh, and uh, Russian forces under Suvorov and Potemkin himself, uh, uh, Potemkin himself, they uh, surrounded the, the Ozi fortress, and uh, they uh, and in December of that year. Uh, Ozi was captured by the uh, Russian forces. So, what uh, with the destruction of the Ottoman navy and uh, with the uh, and with the uh, fall of the Ozi fortress, Ottoman um, superiority, Otto, any Ottoman uh, initiative, any Ottoman advantage over the Black Sea had ended, and the superiority from now on belonged to, belong to the uh, Russia, uh, and. Uh, uh, the uh, it uh, uh, we did the results uh, the results of the, the battle of the Parliament was much deeper and uh, was much more deeper and was much more and was incomparably more decisive than the Cheshma than the battle of Cheshma which was thought to be as the as the decisive battle of the Russo Ottoman wars and it was because uh, uh, the uh, and it was because the battle of the Parliament was an amphibious campaign. Uh, it was conducted uh, in conjunction with large armies, which uh, which uh, allowed the capture of strategic uh, land, uh, strategic land uh, fortifications, uh, uh, land areas, which controlled uh, naval bottlenecks, commercial uh, uh, commercial and uh, navigational bottlenecks in the narrow waters of the Levant, and assured victory. Uh, it uh, it teaches. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, because uh, we we have to discard the Mahanian, we have to discard uh, the Mahanian understanding of big uh, fleet uh, fleet engagement and fleet strategy, uh, which clouds our view uh, of the uh, of the sea power, uh, and uh, uh, turn more to the joint uh, operations. Uh, we have and we have to deepen our understanding of joint operations and uh, amphibious warfare in order to better understand uh, the uh, effect of the sea power upon uh, narrow seas uh, like uh, Black Sea and uh, the Levant in general. Thank you very much and apologies for passing my uh, a lot of time. Uh, dear Mr. Yener, thank you very much for your contributions. We actually have given already five minutes extra for everybody. so. Thank you uh, oh, for your fruitful presentation. Um, now, uh, as our three speakers are completed their presentations, it is time for questions and answers. Uh, I see that so far there has been no question in the chat box. I wonder if there is any question that you would like to uh, direct to our uh, three presenters. We have already finished the presentation, Professor Dr. Naira Tabitse and Associated Professor Dr. George Gabedeva about the oil industry development in Adjara region. And lecturer Mehmet Yashi, together with lecturer Selahattin Alp Erkurtulmuş, uh, are completed their uh, presentation on lighthouses in Black Sea. And PhD candidate Emir Yener, Mr. Yener has been just uh, finished uh, his presentation about the battles in Dan uh, Dinya Perlima. So uh, if there is any questions about these three uh, presentations, we are ready to receive. I will wait for a couple of minutes if there is any question. By the way, I see Professor Alexander uh, Posnikov is already here. Uh, so we will kindly ask him to continue to start actually with his keynote speech. But uh, after seeing if there is any questions for the three presenters. As it was told before, if you would like to ask question, you can also write in the chat box. Uh, you can write your question together with your name and surname and 
to whom you would like to ask your question. We can wait for a couple of minutes. In the meantime, Professor Posnikov, do you hear me? Professor Alexey Posnikov, do you hear me? Okay, 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 it was moot. Uh, do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Professor. Yes, uh, I, wonder, I wonder when I will have an opportunity to present my paper. Uh, thank you, we will be starting shortly. Uh, I will take your two minutes, please. Now I see that there is no any question uh, arised for the first session. Therefore, I would like to end the session and I would like to thank again to all contributors for their uh, fruitful presentations. Uh, now we will move on with Professor Posnikov. Uh, I just give actually a brief introduction about him around half past 10, but because of these technological problems, we were not able to see each other. Now, uh, Professor Posnikov will come forward, but in the meantime, I would like to mention um, I would like to give a brief introduction about him again. So Professor Dr. Posnikov is director of Imago Mundi International Journal on the History of Cartography, Honorable Scientist of the Russian Federation, Honorable Member of the Russian Geographical Society, Academician at International Academy of the History of Science, Corresponding Member of European Academy of Sciences, Chief Research Fellow, former director of SI Vavilov Institute of the History of Science and Technology. I kindly invite Professor Posnikov to deliver us his speech on SLAS on the Black Sea in the early Middle Ages. Sir, we are ready if you are ready. Yes, I'm ready. And um, I would like to apologize uh, for being late. Uh, there is a reason uh, for it. Uh, just recently, some two uh, weeks ago, my computer was crushed uh, by uh, some uh, evil persons. And uh, so uh, my system was badly damaged. And uh, I lost uh, all data uh, necessary to uh, join you uh, right away. And so uh, I uh, do apologize to being late and uh, to cause any uh, difficulties uh, for organizers. And uh, I am uh, happy to be uh, a participant and especially keep speaker uh, in this conference, uh, especially due to the fact that I uh, participated in nearly all congresses on the history of uh, maritime uh, explorations, which had been organized by Admiral Martina Touch and um, in St. Petersburg and in uh, Cyprus and so on. And uh, so I'm sure that the materials of these uh, congresses and symposia uh, will be um, a good uh, materials for 
students of the <clears throat> of your university named after famous Turkish uh, explorer, uh, chart maker, uh, and admiral, uh, Piri Reis. So I am really proud to be with you. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, I will dare to um, uh, begin my uh, presentation. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Since ancient times, uh, the Black Sea was uh, located on the uh, cross crossroads of uh, military and uh, trade uh, company. Uh, campaigns of different peoples and nations who inhabited uh, Eurasia and uh, used it in particular uh, the Volkhov Dnieper uh, route Alone, along about 1,500 kilometers long, uh, which uh, begin uh, at the eastern end of the uh, Gulf of Finland and ran along the uh, Neva River. Uh, the mouth of Lake Neva. Uh, the southwestern part of uh, Lake Ladoga, uh, the Volkhov River, the Volkhov River, Lake Ilmen, uh, the Lova River uh, with uh, passage from uh, the Black, uh, the Baltic to the Black Sea basins along the uh, Uswich, uh, Kaspla, uh, Lucherves rivers, uh, the upper reaches of the Western Dvina uh, were another exit to the Baltic uh, opened and uh, the stem of the skid and the system of the uh, skid uh, travel uh, trailers to the deeper river, Gnezdorf. From there began the way along the uh, Dnieper, which uh, uh, with a crossing uh, near Kiev, a difficult uh, section of the uh, Dnieper uh, rapids and uh, access to the uh, expanse of the black sea in the uh, immediate uh, vicinity of uh, Hersonesses uh, Tauri Taurica. Uh, Karsun and um, Mm, other Byzantic possessions in the Crimea. Uh, the southern section of uh, the road from the Varangians to the Greeks uh, from Kiev down the Dnieper was 
called the Greek way, the mouth of the Dnieper uh, closed near the port town Ale Aleshna, Aleshnia. Uh, subordinated to Kiev, where the boats were re-equipped for the sea sailing. From there, the sea routes uh, route to uh, Sardgrad. Constantinople uh, went along the uh, Bulgar Bulgarian coast uh, of the Black Sea. Next slide, please. A special a place in the history of uh, Russian and uh, of Russia and its uh, and, uh, access to the Black Sea belongs uh, to the Kievan uh, dominion princedom uh, in the delta of the Cuba, Cuban river. Most now it is the uh, Taman Peninsula. Trade uh, and uh, civilization center Tmutarakan. Uh, Despite uh, the relatively short period of its existence, uh, the history. archaeology and uh, uh, ethnography of the unique city attracts uh, the attention and uh, discusses of many uh, student uh, studies. The results of which have been uh, published in many uh, and numerous articles and uh, some 10 monographs, among which uh, the works of uh, Viktor Nikolaevich uh, Chekhria, Chikriadze, uh, born in 1978, a uh, mm, research, research fellow at the Department of Medieval Archaeology uh, of the Institute of Archaeology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's is currently uh, outstanding. Viktor Nikolaevich Chaidze believes that in Dmutarakain, uh, uh, Greek um, Matorha was very strong Byzantine uh, influence due above all to the uh, greatest activity of uh, sea and uh, ground trade uh, relative relations uh, both direct directly with Byzantine and uh, uh, through its 
mediation. Next slide, please. Thus, this... Uh, uh, dear professor. Oh, excuse uh, me. Please tell me when you get tired, I can uh, read for you if you wish until the pages of the photographs or we can go like that. It is up to you. Oh, yes, uh, I, <laughs> I am afraid that you will be tired due to my poor uh, eyesight uh, to hear my <laughs> reading. So it's all up to you, really. But I can help you and read a little uh, fast until the yes. uh, photographs, yes. and then you can move on if you wish. Please. Uh, and then uh, I will only show... Uh, I, I am he yes, I hear you, and then uh, before pictures, uh, I will uh, again be with you. Okay, then please let me read, uh, dear Posnikov. Uh, thank yes. you very much for sharing your study with us, first thank of all. Thank you very much. Thank and you. thank you for letting me to read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Excuse me. Thus, uh, these coins originally acted as the main means of money circulation in Tumutarakan and then served as small change. The second event connected with Mstislav, the founding by him after his victory over the Kasogians in 1022 of the Church of the Most Holy Mother of God in Tumutarakan, which becomes the patronal church of the prince and simultaneously the center of the Russian ethno-confessional community connected with the Russian power. Russian clergy begins its activity in the region. At the same time, the Tumutarakan, there was also a Greek community oriented towards Constantinople. However, there is no data on the demarcation of the sphere of influence of the two exilatiastical organizations. Probably due to the fact that Tumutarakan was under the protectorate of the old Russian state as an overseas possession. It had a special extraordinary status, which allowed peacefully coexist two Christian communities separately performing their religious rights in the fr framework of common for the Orthodox Christian faith. In 1955, Boris Alexandrovich Rybakov's expeditions in Tumutarakan uncovered the foundations of a medieval church, which is identified with the Church of the Most Holy Mother of God. After the death of Prince Yaroslav in 1054, the Chernigov land, land as well as Tumutarakan, passed to his son Sviatoslav. Probably, probably then Sviatoslav's son Gleb was made governor here. In the early 60s of the uh, 11th century, after a conflict with the Kiev prince Izyaslav Sviatoslavovich, the monk Nikon of the Kiev uh, Peshersk La uh, Lavra arrives in Tumutarakan and builds the monastery of the Most Holy Virgin near the city. In historiography, this monastery is traditionally considered the main spiritual outpost of the Slavic presence in Tumutarakan. Traces of Nikon's monastery, despite the efforts of the expedition of Boris Alexandrovich Rybakov, was not found, but in 2005, on top of Mount Zelenskaya, six kilometers south of Tumutarakan, were found in remains of the 11th century identified as an Orthodox monastery. Note also the Greek inscription, inscription carved on a marble slab found in Tumutarakan. Rested the servant of God Ionicus, the monk, the builder in his holy monastery. In the month of October 23rd, on the third day of the seventh hour of the year, uh, 1078, in Dictman 2. The term oidikon, oikodom, found in a number of similar Byzantine inscriptions predominantly refers to the founder of the monastery. 
According to the Chronicles in six, uh, 1064, uh, Gleb Sviatoslavich was expelled from Tumutarakan by Prince Rostislav Vladimirovich, who fled from Novgorod, the eldest of the Rurikovich clan, but deprived uh, of an appendage. This president is the first in a series of Caesar of this city by outcast princes with the purpose of gather forces and return to Russia to reconquer their fiefdoms. The role, uh, the rule of such princes in Tumutarakan was not recognized as legitimate in the metropolis, which is eloquently proved by the raid of Gleb's father, Sviatoslav Yaroslavich, Prince of Chernigov, on Tumutarakan in 1065. Rostislav had to leave the city Sviatoslav, coming to the Tumorakan, confirmed again Gleb's power and returned north. After the Rostislav came back and banished Gleb for the second time, Rostislav's usurper reign, reign the Tumorakan, is marked by two moments. And of course, such a large trading center as Tumorakan could not be et uh, ethnically heterogeneous, Greeks, Yasses of the Alanian tribes, Kasks, Kasoks, Kok, Kashes, Kasaks, Kesaks, exotonym uh, of the modern addicts mentioned in the Russian chronicles before the Mongolian invasion, as well as frequently found in Arabic, Byzantine, Georgian, Armenian, and other historical and geographical sources of the Middle Ages, Kozara, Kozare, plural Hazars, Turkish pe uh, Turkic people in the territory of southeastern Russia, ancient Russian Kozare. The Russian population in the city was represented by the Posadnik. The prince with his retinue and the trading people with those activities in the North Caucasus is associated a significant number of Russian things. Some objects testify to the stay of the Russian princes in Tumutarakan. The, uh, in addition to Tumutarakan stone, which will be discussed below, there is a bow with a Rurikovich trident on it, found during the excavations. There is reason to believe that this bow belonged to only son of Mitislav Vladimirovich. Evstafiai died in 1033. In Tumutarakan, a stone icon of the 11th century depicting Saint Bleb, and the inscriptions on either side of the standing figure, David and GLB was discovered. The icon belonged to Gleb Sietoslavich, David Begin, uh, being his younger brother, died in 1123. Archaeologists also discovered three Slavic Cyrillic inscription graffiti, but on the handle uh, of an uh, amphora of the second half of the 10th century. Probably the ending of a, a Slavic name, Bino, of the wall of an amphora of the 11th century, and Dusnik of the handle of a glazed jack of the second half of the 11th century, the name of a vessel derived from the word cod, a small barrel. Researchers know evidence of the contacts of the Tumutarakans with peoples of the Northern Caucasus. It is an inscription graffiti dated to the last quarter of the 11th, first quarter of the 12th centuries, which was, was found on one of the walls of St. Sophia Cathedral in Kiev. That Kasok, a Tumutarakan road coming from the sands. For I, Lord, I long to come to thee of resurrection, oh my soul. The first mention of Tumutarakan in the Russian chronicles occurs in the year 988, when Vladimir uh, Sujatoslavich enthrones his son, Mislav, in the city. Perhaps a few years before that, the city of Tamatarha, which had been under the control of the Hazar uh, Kaganate, for the more than a century, becomes a possession of Kievan Rus and receives the name to Mutarakan. There is no doubt that it is about the feat Hazar Kaganat. As a result of his campaign of Prince 
Sviatoslav Igorovich in 1965 uh, and also about Korsenian campaign in 987-989 years Vladimir Sviatoslavich. And in spite of the fact that in written resources, there is no data on capture of Tamatarha by Sviatoslav or Vladimir, practically on all excavated sites of a settlement, the layer of the fire dated second half of 10th century is revealed. The fire could be a consequence of the capture of the city by the troops of Sviatoslav or or Vladimir. Apparently, Sviatoslav army, or part of it, reached Tamatarha as a result of Hazar rule was legitimated here, and the city came under the authority of the Kivan prince. Prince Vladimir captures Kherson, and it was at this time that the chronicles mentioned Tamatarakan, which is connected with the distribution of the throne, uh, thrones between Vladimir's son. Uh, can everybody follow? I didn't ask, I just read. Oh, okay, okay, it's so excellent. <laughs> okay, uh, I am moving on. In the early 90s of the 11th century, after a conflict with the Kiev prince Izyaslav Sviatoslavovich, the monk Nikon of the Kiev Peshert Lavra arrives in Tumutarakan and builds the monastery of the Most Holy Virgin near the city. In historiography, this monastery is traditionally considered the main spiritual outpost of the Slavic presence in Tumutarakan. Traces of Nikon's monastery, despite the efforts of the expedition of Boris Alexandrovich Rybakov, was not found out in 2005 on top of Mount Selenskaya, six kilometers south of Tumutarakan, were found in remains of the 11th century identified as an Orthodox monastery. Not also Greek inscription carved on a marble slab. So, uh, I think we read this before. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I think we read in this in in Dictaman two, um, and the term icodom. It was the same um, paragraph in before the slides. Uh, the term Icodon found in a number of similar Byzantine inscription. Uh, okay, I see that we read this paragraph before, dear professor. What? We uh, read this paragraph two slides before. What, 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 what? Okay. What to begin? I... Uh, I am just seeing here. I will start from here, if you let me do. Convera, yes, please. Oh. After that, Rotislav came back and banished the lab. We read this before. Rotislav's reign was short lived. In 1067, he was poisoned by a Byzantine official sent by Greeks, a Kotopan. The annals contain direct indication that Rostislav charged a tribute and active policy of the unruly Russian prince near the Crimean possessions of Byzantium caused fears in the empire. As follows from the Vita Fyodosi Pesharsky, after Ratislav death, the inhabitants of Tumotarakan begged Nikon to go Chernigov to Sviatoslav Varavlovich to ask the Gleb to return to Tumarakan. Yeah. Nikon, with this high authority, was the man to carry out the request. We emphasize that in the source of the first time, the population of Tumatarakan acts independently and importantly insists on the return of the city to the city of the legitimate prince deputy, Gleb, accompanied by Nikon, returns to Tumatarakan. In the winter of 1068, he measured the distance from Tumatarakan to Kersh, on the ice, a striking, true, still debatable material evidence of the active presence of the Russians on the Black Sea and in the Crimea is the Tumatarakan stone, a marble slab with an old Russian inscription that reports the measurement of the distance between the two cities, Tumatarakan and Kersh in 1068. The stone was found at the Taman Peninsula in 1792 by Vice Admiral Pavel Vasilevich Pustoshkin when he was sending Black Sea 
Kossat tutamam. Currently the Tumutara Khan stone is stored in the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. A copy of the stone in a sculptural composition with the old Russian prince Gleb and the chronicler Nikon installed Kersh. Kersh, yes. Mm -hmm. Nikon was his high authority, was the man to carry out the request. We emphasize that in the source of the first time, the population of Tumatarakan acts independently and importantly insists in the return of the city in the legitimate prince deputy. Gleb accompanied by Nikon, uh, we read this. I am moving on. This is the same as we read before. Okay, the stone is the oldest evidence of the goddessic works of ancient Russia and a unique archaeological monument of the Tumutarakan princedom. The following text was written on the stone. In the summer of uh, 6576, um, six Gleb, the prince measured the sea on the ice from Tumutarakan to Kersh, 14,000 Sasan. The distance on a stone was designated precisely. Exactly 24 kilometers divided Kersh Orthodox Temple from Tumutarakan Temple. How the expedition of the Russian prince measured the distance still is a mystery. In 1069, Gleb is already in Novogorod and does not return to Tumutarakan anymore. The next mention of Tumutarakan in the Annals of 1077, at that time it was ruled by Roman Sviatoslavich, Gleb's brother probably, who replaced him as governor. A year earlier, Roman's father Sviatoslav Yaroslavich died, after which uh, the Chernigo principality was seized by his brother Vis uh, Visavolot and his nephew Vladimir Monomak. As a result of these events in 1077, Roman's cousin Boris Yvas uh, Heslavich fled to Tumutarakan in the following 1078. His brother Oleg Sviatoslavich, both deprived of the fiefdoms. Tumutarakan leaves submission to Chernigov, where Visevolot rules, and the three Russian princes who became outcast in Russia begins to fight for their fiefdoms. In the same year, 1078, Oleg and Boris allied with the Polovtsi rebelled against Visevolot. The campaign was unsuccessful. Boris and Kiev Prince Izlaslav, who supported Visevolot's brother, perished in a battle on Nesitana Niva. Oleg and a small band fled back, and Visevolot managed to make peace with the commons who killed Roman on the way back. At the, at the same time, the chronicle tells Kozaranes, uh, inhabitants of Tumutaraka, captured Oleg and sent him to Constantinople, probably with the consent of Nicephoros III, Botoniatius. It should be emphasized that as after uh, Rostislav's death, the city's population once again sides with the great prince power. After Oleg's removal, Visevolot Sietoslovich puts in Tumotorakan as governor Ratibor, the only non governor of non princely origin. There are assumptions that in 11th century, governors could be Estafai, those Molir Dovul was found in Tumotorakan, and Nam, whose break, uh, break teeth comes from the same place. Yes, and uh, yes, the next. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. I am just seeing how many pages there are left. Uh, okay, I uh, keep reading. A large number of seals with the inscription WT Ratibor, widespread in ancient Rus, belong to Ratibor. Two specimen comes from Kersh. The seals are an analog of Retibor's coin, which have recently become famous and originate from the territory of the Taman Peninsula. The coins are minted from billion and uh, silver and bear the inscription from Retibor. Apparently, the minting was caused by a shortage of coins in Tumutaraka. 
Ratibor's governorship didn't last long. In 1081, two more Perrier, Paria princes, David Igorovich and Vladimir Rostislavich, son of the poisoned Rostislav, ran to Tumutarakan. Ratibor was captured and probably exiled to Kiev. Sources do not give an unequal answer whether princes ruled Tumutarakan together or someone of them dominated. Recently became known an early type of a princi uh, princely seal of David discovered in Sudak. Crimea. In, eight, third, uh, ten, uh, in 1083, Oleg uh, Siataslovich returns from Byzantium, who captured the two princes, releases them to Russia, beats Koza, uh, Kozars, and again becomes the ruler of Tomotarakan. In science, was uh, firmly established an opinion that during Oleg's stay in Byzantium, between him and Emperor Alexei, the first coming, uh, an agreement was made, according to which after Oleg's death, Tumutarakan's uh, void return would uh, return under the Byzantine protectorate. The existing sources do not allow to unequivocally confirm or deny this version, but a number of indirect data indicate its favor. Oleg returning from Byzantium could not be confirmed and established in Tumutarakan without outside help and only Roma could help him. Thus the opinion firmly established in historiography that Oleg being in the Greek captivity married a noble Greek woman, Theophana Muzolan, cannot be neither confirmed nor refuted on the basis of the available documentary evidence up to 1094, when after the death of Visevolod Yaroslavin, Oleg and the Polovstians attacked Chernigov from Tumutarakan. The chronicle says nothing about the activity this prince in Tumutarakan. However, it is known that the, in the 80s, minting of silver coins with an image on the observe as uh, of Oleg's patron saint, uh, the Archangel Michael and an uh, encryption of the reverse. Lord, help me began here. Michael, um, Oleg's Christian name, the prototype of this minting were coins of the uh, millierly Michael the seventh Duka, as well as stamps of Roman uh, Siatoslovich. On weight norms, coins grav uh, gravitate to the Byzantium type of minting. Oleg owns nine currently uh, known stamps, on the observe of which there is an image of the Archangel Michael in full growth. On the reverse, the Greek six line inscription, Lord, had Michael, Archon uh, Archonte, Matraha, Zikia, and all of Hazaria. According to G.G. Litavrin, Oleg Michael's seal belongs to the type of provincial governor stamps of the Byzantine emperor, which may testify to the treaty relations between Oleg and Alexei I Komnin, which implied the recognition of at least formal sovereignty of the empire over Tumutarakan. The above mentioned allows us to claim that the coins and the seals of the um, prince Arconet correspond to imperial standards, and it, it may indicate that during the Oleg's reign, Tumutorakan was in vassal subordination of Byzantium. Yes. Uh, yes. Is, is it next is uh, illustrations? Yes. Uh, the, we have two pages, but if you want, we can move to illustration from here. Uh, yes. Uh, two pages. Uh, I don't know <laughs> whether you would like to read that pages, but uh, we, it is we, now. Can, we, yes. can, we can finish with this uh, yes. uh, sentence about uh, it's becoming a, a province of Byzantium. Yes, we, we can finish with it. Okay. Yeah. Now your illustration starts from this page on. Yes, yes, my illustrations, and uh, uh, I would like to see. Yes, 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 okay. 
uh, this is um, yes no no, no. Mm -hmm. okay i am moving on yeah, yeah. yes this one okay uh, uh, this is a uh, um, copy of uh, nicholas rurich uh, uh, painting uh, Sadko. Sadko was a legendary hero, but uh, here is uh, very well shown uh, the type of uh, old Russian uh, boats which traveled by uh, that way I described in my paper. Yes. Uh, next, please. Yes. Is this okay? The archaeological. Uh, yes, yes, yes. It is actually it is a place of Tmutarakan, uh, archaeologically uh, started, and um, uh, you can see a part of uh, Kerch uh, of uh, Equatory. Uh, which had been measured uh, by a leg. And uh, this is uh, just um, an ar archaeology site with uh, some foundations of uh, buildings uh, of Tmutaraka. Next, please. Mm -hmm. The stone. Ah, yes. This is uh, the uh, stone, Tmutaraka <laughs> stone, uh, which is now uh, at the uh, Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Uh, now it is uh, mm, proved without any doubt that uh, this stone is uh, original and uh, as old as uh, it is uh, mm, told in, the, uh, in our sources. Uh, so um, we uh, heard uh, the, uh, uh, the information about uh, this stone, information about measuring this uh, distance between uh, Mutarakain and Kerch. Next, please. Mm -hmm. Overseas guests. Yes, uh, this is also uh, Rurich. Uh, um, uh, out uh, sees guests. Uh, it's one of his early uh, paintings, uh, which shows uh, again the strokes, the boats in which Varangians and uh, uh, Russians. Uh, traveled by uh, that waterways leading to Black Sea. Next, please. Yes, uh, that's that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, our chair, uh, our beautiful chair, for <laughs> such a, um, an excellent reading of my text. Uh, I'm sorry uh, that uh, I had to explore you <laughs> and uh, you made it. <laughs> uh, Thank you, dear professor. The, lots of words were uh, very <laughs> not aching to me that I didn't know, but I am sorry if the misspelling about the Russian names. Or no, Russian names. Yes, uh, there was an uh, only uh, for my, uh, uh, there is the only mistake. Uh, it's a family of our great uh, archaeologist and uh, scientist academician Rybakov. <laughs> Rybakov, not Rybakov, but Rybakov. Hey, thank you. <laughs> so I'm sorry again. Yes. Uh, um, thank you, dear professor, for your uh, very interesting and new um, new topic for us to see the actually very, very real stone and the history of it behind it. Thank you very much. Now, I believe the Admiral Atach would like to talk. If uh, Admiral, can you hear me? 
Yeah. Um, okay, I am just trying to connect. Mirror attach, yes. Hello. 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 Uh, do you hear me, Professor? Yes. It's so nice to see, not to see, but to hear your voice. Yes. Uh, this is our this is our honor to have you here. I know your value. Uh, I know you very well. Uh, for me, this is a historical moment that your voice recorded in the university's computers. And uh, it, it, sorry for the technical problems occurred this morning, but finally it has been solved and we heard your voice. I hope your health is okay. You're okay. Yeah. And in the future, yeah. in the future, I'm still willing to be with you in the face-to-face -face congresses. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you very much, Admiral Atech. And uh, I uh, remember very well our congresses uh, together and uh, organized by you. And um, I think that materials of these congresses and this uh, symposium as well uh, would be a very good uh, material for your students, as a matter of fact. Uh, and don't, not only your students, but uh, for students of other uh, maritime universities uh, all over the world. Uh, I think that uh, maybe it would be possible to uh, publish uh, in some way uh, these materials online, of course, no, no, not necessary uh, in paper, but uh, online. Uh, I think that these materials are very, very uh, good for uh, those who are interested in the maritime history. And uh, so, Let's uh, continue our work together. I, I will be happy to meet you in uh, Russia and uh, to okay, thank participate you. in any other events with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Professor, uh, I assure you, we're going to have our proceedings of this uh, symposium. Excellent. And we will put your work in it. Thank and, you. And uh, I'm really happy today that I heard your voice. You're in good health. This is one thing very important for us. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sunda. Thank you, dear Admiral. Uh, thank you very much for everybody for uh, staying here and listening all the contributions, all the presentations. Before going to lunch break, we express our gratitude to Rector Professor Dr. Oral Erdogan, the Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Tamer Kran, to our contributors and to guests. We will be here at 1.30. Uh, so uh, have a nice lunch. See Thank you me. afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will be starting within two minutes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the second part of our symposium will be starting with a keynote speech. Uh, please let me give a brief introduction before Professor starts his speech. Alexander Mikaberitse is Professor of History and Ruth Herring Noel and Do Chair at Louisiana State University, Shreveport, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He has taught history at American universities for almost two decades and lectured on strategy and policy at the US Naval War College and US Military Academy at West Point. He has written extensively on the 18th, 19th century military and political history and participated in the writing of the critically acclaimed West Point History of Warfare, the official military history textbook of the US Military Academy. His most recent book, The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History, has been translated into several languages and garnered various accolades, including the Distinguished Book of the Year Award from the Society of, uh, for Military History. Uh, we are very grateful to have you here with us, dear Professor. Uh, by the way, we are really sorry what happened in Louisiana because of the hurricane, and we are so happy that you, you are fine. Uh, I welcome Dr. Mika Beritze to deliver us his speech on the source of all the seas towards a new history of the Black Sea. Sir? Thank you. Iyi günler, sevgili meslektaşlarım ve dostlarım. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me. It is uh, five o'clock in the morning in Louisiana, uh, so unfortunately I was unable to attend uh, your earlier sessions, uh, which undoubtedly were insightful and, and, and enjoyable, especially I want to uh, listen to Professor Posnikov's presentation since I have read quite a few of his books, uh, and um, I'm, I'm sorry to have missed it. Uh, it is a great honor to be here, especially because I'm a land lover <laughs> historian uh, presenting at the Maritime Symposium. Uh, um, the, let's see. I think you have the right to screen share right now. That's right. Uh, and it is right here. The Ottoman Sultans styled themselves um, as the rulers of the two seas, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And it is not um, difficult to understand the Ottoman fixation on commanding the passage between them. Holding the Straits uh, had been one of the keys uh, to the seizure of Constantinople, Istanbul, 
and it remained the quintessential element in the security of the new Ottoman capital after the conquest. It also ensured easy travel between the two major components of the Ottoman state. Most importantly, the sea was crucial to the Ottoman economy. For all these reasons, the Black Sea held a particular place in the Ottoman imagination. It was considered a distinct region of the Sultan's domain, bounded on the south by the Anatolian heartlands and on the north by the vast uh, Ripchak steppe, the Dashti Ripchak, which served as a buffer between the Ottoman, the growing Ottoman domain and the Polish and Muscovite realms in the north. In 1538, with the Ottoman acquisition of the Bujak district between the Prut and the Nestor River, the entire Black Sea coastline was integrated into the well-guarded uh, dominions of the House of Osman. The western coastline from the Bosphorus around uh, to the Nestor River, the Crimean ports, the coastline areas that connected them and the Straits of Kerch became Sanjaks, the sub-provinces of the Ottoman Empire. The southern coastline was likewise divided into uh, provincial administrations, while sections of the Caucasian coastline was commanded by the garrisons inside the fortified ports or ruled indirectly through Georgian princes. Evliya Chelebi, probably the greatest of the Ottoman travelers, spent time in nearly every corner of the Ottoman world, and he was but he was convinced that the real center of the empire's empire lay in its command of the Black Sea. But if the truth of the matter is looked at, he wrote in his great Sayahat Name, or the record of travels, the source of all the seas is the Black Sea, and hence the uh, uh, title of my, of my talk. There is a deep bias, however, in, uh, in historical uh, research uh, that I represent and that so many of the panelists uh, in, in this wonderful symposium uh, represent. History, um, I think many of my colleagues, and I certainly am one of them, uh, history we seem to think happens on land, on the ground. What happens on the water is just a scene setter for the real actions uh, that takes place on the continent or the sea is usually perceived as, as a ways of getting somewhere rather than uh, actual places where history takes place. But oceans and seas have a history of their own, not merely as highways of uh, boundaries, but as central players in distinct stories of human interaction and exchange. As great American writer uh, Mark Twain uh, wrote about the, the mighty Mississippi River, waterways have their own history that is not just physical, not that of the currents and floods and sediments, but also historical memory, the history of histories, of, of the long epochs, of comings and goings, of different peoples, of characters who populate their shores. Indeed, shifting our gaze from land to the bodies of water can be illuminated. It forces us to think critically about such labels as region and nation, and the role that these categories, the one, the facile in many respects, uh, categories in, uh, play in how we perceive the world. It prompts a re-examination of the very meaning of the place, how it changes over time and how intellectual lines that we draw uh, are, are, are sometimes capricious than we uh, would like to admit. For some parts of the world, the idea of waterways as the defining elements in the human history is uncontroversial. Um, we are accustomed to speaking, for example, about the Mediterranean, probably the most famous of these maritime regions. I like to think of myself as working within the Atlantic, right, Atlantic realm, uh, which is a, a, a subfield of historical studies and rather perceived as a meaningful place. Other bodies of water also have their own unique association. Think about the Amazon or the Mississippi, which uh, immediately gives you these uh, visions of images. For these and other waterways, scholars have charted the common economic pursuits, styles of life and political predicaments that have linked one coast with another, uh, sometimes over great distances. But images, associations, are less readily available for the Black Sea, at least for the Western audiences. It is a body of water familiar to few people outside the region itself. For entire stretches of the Black Sea's history, there are no more than a handful of specialist monographs to tell its history, and probably the best of them is Charles King's The Black History, 
or Neil Atkinson's The Right of Black History, which is a travel of, but nonetheless. Major powers from Byzantium to Ottomans to Russia at various times had to see at the center of their strategic aims, but there has been little research on the uh, transnational history of the region. For the areas around the Black Sea, the result has been a tradition of history writing that has apportioned the coastline to different realms. The modern history of the Balkan Peninsula, for example, is usually seen either as an adjunct to the history of Central Europe or as the uh, uh, agglomeration of uh, disconnected ethno-national histories. The Ukrainian and Russian lands are treated separately from the Balkans, either as a part of Russian imperial history or in the Ukrainian tradition uh, uh, or in, in within U Ukrainian historical tradition. The same goes for the Caucasus, both North and South. To say that the Georgian maritime historiography is meager is an understatement. In many ways, a reflection of the Georgian sense of the sea as a zwa or the, or the borderland. The Ottoman Empire is almost exclusively described as the land empire. And when the Ottoman maritime history, as rich as it is, is discussed, it is invariably situated in the Mediterranean red or Red Seas. And, very, uh, uh, and not the Black Sea. This mental map is, however, distinctly of modern vintage. Not all long ago, the idea of the Black Sea as a kind of unit would have made a great deal of sense, not only to local populations and, and leaders, but also to Western diplomats and, and writers who spend their careers dealing with the sea and, and its uh, discontents. In the 19th century, the Black Sea lay at the heart of the Eastern question, the complex rivalries right, between Russia and the Ottoman Empire and the Western European powers trying to, uh, to project their interests across this region. Between the two world wars, the area stood at the intersection of the turbulent Balkans, the Bolsheviks, the European uh, protectorates and the Levant. Later, the countries of the region were in the front line in the global struggles uh, of the early 20th century, the, the rise of the Soviet Union, and the Soviet projections of its authority in the, uh, all, uh, across, the Balkan, uh, across the Black Sea region. Since the end of communism, Southeastern Europe has become a region of troubled political transitions and economically struggling states. Um, same applies to the, uh, the Caucasus uh, as well. In the 1990s, the idea of homogenous Eastern Europe was largely replaced by the notion of equally heterogeneous Southeastern Europe a place at the timeless meeting place um, of mutually hostile regions and cultures, the transition zone between the real Europe and something else. And the newspaper headlines, I think, contributed to this sense of division rather than uh, a sense of unity. The, the, the wars of Soviet succession, series of conflicts in Moldova, Georgia, Azerbaijan and elsewhere, Turkey's own um, you know, conflicts with the internal conflict with the, uh, with the Kurdish insurgency. There was surely something about the strength of this communal belief or allegiance to um, that made this region perpetually at odds with itself. But over the long sweep of history, it is difficult to argue that the lands around the Black Sea, an area that might be called the wider southeastern Europe, have been more volatile so, uh, a sense of ethnic identity more deeply felt the questions of land, custom, religion, more devices than any other part of Europe. It's certainly not true. In fact, in many periods, this region was a good deal less so. If there is an overarching story to history of the Black Sea, it is not about conflict and violence, least of all the kind that is said to define this fracture zone between, to repeat that Huntingtonian notion of uh, clash of civilizations. No, rather, it is about the belated advent of the central organizing ideas of the 19th and 20th century. It is a place to which the modern state came quite late, the culturally defined nation state even later. In his uh, recent magnum opus on the Mediterranean Sea, David Abulafia defined the term Mediterranean as a surface of the sea itself, its shores and its islands, particularly the port cities that provided the main departure and arrival points for those crossing it. It is a useful framework that can be applied to the Black Sea, but a far more rewarding, albeit more challenging task would be to transplant Rodelian famous scaffold and envision the Black Sea history as encompassing places beyond the immediate sea shorelines, 
Sadly, we still lack fresh histories of the Black Sea written within this Brodelian or Abulafian framework. The traditional themes for maritime history developed around three separate and isolated subjects, the history of maritime exploration, naval warfare, and economic affairs, shipbuilding, overseas trade, commercial fishing. There are quite a few exciting Black Sea studies in these areas, but they oftentimes reveal narrow emphasis on national perspectives. And that's especially true about, uh, about the naval warfare in the Black Sea, which is almost exclusively dominated by the uh, Russian uh, perspective, especially in the modern era, uh, which is, a, as, a, as a 18th, 19th century specialist, I, 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 can, I can testify to um, having, having spent the last several years working on those Ottoman wars that uh, the Ottoman perspective is, is certainly uh, uh, missing. In this regard, it is important, I think, um, to broaden our uh, horizons and, and attempt this transnational uh, approach to the Black Sea studies. It is also important to define several key terms as they apply to the Black Sea as we embark on this. One is probably the very notion of a Black Sea region. Broadly speaking, region like culture and race is a concept quite difficult to define um, uh, a word whose analytical uses usually mask a multitude of, of connotations. So, um, no regional label can stand uh, a close examination, but as soon as one tries to identify an essential set of characteristics that is meant to distinguish a broad geographical unit from another one, certainly those uh, characteristics might begin to look uh, ephemeral. But at base, however, regions are not about uh, commonalities of language or culture or religion or other constituents of the regions um, might share. Rather, they're about connections, profound and durable connections, linkages among people and communities that seem uh, to uh, re that's reside within the space. And I think Black Sea fits such a regional definition. Across the last few thousand years, peoples, empires, countries, entered and exited at different points, but the center of the stage was the sea, its littoral. The wings of this Black Sea region therefore could extend from the Balkans to the Caucasus, from the steppelands of Ukraine and Russia to central Anatolia. Conveniently, almost all the countries in this area today are members of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization, international forum established to strengthen the commercial, political, and cultural ties. In the narrow sense, geographical sense. Only six countries can claim membership of this bulk of the Black Sea, a region, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, Russia, Georgia, and Turkey. These states control the major port facilities and claim territorial waters of the coastline. But more broadly, however, the confines of the Black Sea region can be stretched far beyond the confines of the six states and encompass as many as 22 countries. Because what happens upstream from the river on the rivers that flow into the Black Sea, the Danube, the Dnieper, the Don rivers, certainly has a direct relevance to the story of the Black Sea, to the health of the sea, to the livelihood of the populations that live around it. In terms of its history, parts of the seas have sometimes been controlled by a major imperial power, but the coastlines have always been divided among local rulers and modern states. In terms of recent politics, in the early 1990s, the littoral countries and several of their neighbors committed themselves to building this regional cooperation in political and economic terms. What constitutes a Black Sea region depends not only on how one asks the question, but also when it is asked. In the ancient world, a string of Greek cities created a trading emporium across the Black Sea, connecting the various corners of this region to a single commercial network the Greek network. And that network was shaken by the rise of powers from the hinterland and by the advance of the great Sassanid empires and the Roman empire, the, uh, uh, the conquest of the Byzantines, the relations among the Byzantines and nomadic peoples of the North, as Professor Kosnikov pointed out uh, uh, earlier today, as well as the Christian kings and princes in the Balkans and Caucasus uh, 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 rising and, and falling. In the Middle Ages, the Black Sea world was revived by the entrepreneurial spirit of the great Italian city-states, Genoa, Venice. And for a time, it came under the sway of this single empire. 
even a single man, the Ottoman Sultan. Later, the rise of Russia transformed the sea into the site of a centuries-long struggle between the powers that controlled the northern and southern shores. In turn, the national movements of the 19th century, favoring smaller, uh, smaller countries of the empires, worked to bring bits of the sea into the uh, uh, control under the control of these newly formed nation states. Now, today it is difficult to argue that there is anything approaching a common Black Sea region regional identity among the all inhabitants of the coastline. Of course, political trajectories and political realities across the wider southeastern Europe are varied. Right? Democratic, authoritarian, reformist, reactionary, realist, uh, you know, political leaders are more likely to set themselves off from their neighbors than to engage in a genuine regional cooperation. Still, the sea has long been a distinct place, a region defined by cross-sea relationships, both cooperative and conflictual, evolving the movement of people, ideas, goods. Over the long course of the history, communities around the Black Sea coastlines have touched one another in enduring ways, religious practices, linguistic forms, literary styles, food ways, among other areas of social life are all joined together in a web of this mutual influence that is readily apparent to even the most casual visitor to this region. Another term that I think is important for us to bear is the notion of frontier. The great uh, historian of Inner Asia, Owen Lattimore, uh, once noted that frontier is not the same as a boundary. The boundary represents this intended limit of a political power, the farthest extent to which a state or empire is able to project its will within a geographic region. A frontier, however, is a zone that exists on both sides of the boundary. It is a place inhabited by distinct communities of boundary crossers, people whose lives and livelihoods depend on their being experts in transgressing both the physical boundaries between the polities as well as the social ones between ethnic, religious, and linguistic groups. And Black Sea region offers many examples of frontier people that are not simply peripheral actors in human history, but distinctive, highly adaptive cultures in their own rights. And this is important to, for the history, um, um, or, or, or the crafting of the history of the Black Sea. People shape themselves against the image of the frontier as much as perhaps even more than the frontier shapes them. As Lattimore's work revealed, Encounters with Turkish speaking populations in Eurasia were central to Chinese understanding of civilization and proper conduct. Likewise, in 19th century Russia, expansion and settlement in Siberia and the Caucasus were crucial components of both Russian imperial identity and the vision of Russia as a continental Eurasian power. What can find the same dynamics at work uh, um, across the Black Sea region? At various points in its history, the Black Sea has been uh, a frontier in both the senses. The focus of the distinct communities defined by the position between the empires or states and the foil against which this cultural and political identities of outsiders have been built. However, to think of the sea as a timeless frontier at the meeting place of different civilizations, Greek and barbarian, Christian, Muslim, uh, Oriental, Balkan, Eurasian, whatever the concept you can throw at, against which Europeans have perpetually defined themselves is to read back onto the distant past. Much of the sea was indeed a frontier in the former sense in the earlier modern period when the steppe land along the northern shore was still a sparsely populated region at the intersection of the Ottoman Empire, Poland, Russia. It was a frontier in the latter sense for much of the 19th century when the Black Sea lay between Europe's rising and falling powers. But the longer history of the sea and its littoral is not simply the story of the geographic periphery and its gradual absorption into empires, nor is it only a story of the insidious construction of region as a backward uh, place on the, outs on, the, on the margins of Europe. Rather, it is about the ebb and flow of the sea's peripheral status, a long wave oscillating between the backwardness and isolation on one hand and substantial integration with wider Mediterranean, European, and Eurasian worlds on the other. The frontiers that have run along the coastline and through the middle of the sea have been multiple, um, ecological, religious, economic, but none have been perennial, and the outlines of one have rarely overlapped exactly with those of another. 
when the ancient Greeks first encountered the Black Sea, it lay literally at the edge of the, the of their known world, the place inhabited by these mythical beasts, half man and heroes. However, from the middle of the first millennium, the growth of the Greek trading colonies not only stitched these coastlines together, but also brought them into a broader system of exchange with the Mediterranean. That integrated system lasted until the beginning of the first millennium AD, when the opening up of the other sources of wealth reduced the significance of the Black Sea ports. These old connections were revised somewhat in the early Byzantine period, and it certainly expanded with the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and, and the connection of the Black Sea back again to the Mediterranean. At the Ottoman Empire declined in the Mediterranean, the Black Sea became the prize that the sultans guarded jealously, its coasts in large part sealed from the foreign commercial and political influence. That situation would obtain an Ill, the opening of the seas to European merchants in the late 18th century. And from that point on, the sea was never again the preserve of any single power until the uh, Russian, uh, Russian imperial might overran the Ottomans. From the late 19th century through the 20th century, the Black Sea coastline was carved out among a number of newly formed nation states, with each asserting a right not only to a piece of the coastline, but also a section of the coastal water. And the coming of modern state did not automatically ensure the easy integration of this littoral in the broader structures. The coastal areas remained largely peripheral to the new states whose power centered, uh, centers lay inland uh, rather than on the coastline. The modern history of the Black Sea is not the story of the center and peripheries struggling, tugging within each of the states of this sea. Finally, there is the term nation. The ideology of nation as it has been understood in much of modern European history contains at least three propositions. One is analytical that the nation, defined in terms of common language, culture, history, and distinct homeland, is and always has been fundamental unit in human societies, far more basic uh, than religion or class or some other association. The second is normative, that the nation should command the exclusive allegiance of all of its citizens whose identities and destinies are bound to it. And third is kind of prophetic that in instances in which the demographic boundaries of nations and political boundaries of states do not uh, coincide, social movements that seek to rectify this disjunction are both predictable and, and, and encouraging. Uh, for the Black Sea today, um, the Black, uh, you know, across the Black Sea region, history is viewed through this national lens. The main points in the historical narrative are those in which previously unconscious nations come to perceive themselves as distinctive and then rise to throw all foreign oppression. It is a story about how people become nations and how those nations in turn become nation states. Yet writing the history of nations is always about silencing other voices. It involves drawing lines around people, excising connections among human communities and reading into the messy past um, to, to find these pure identities of national development. The real life of peoples and cultures is usually cacophonous, sometimes even gloriously so, but it is rarely so. It's rarely about one nation, however it is divine. And I would like to propose to change the way we approach the history instead of traditional framework, adopt a transnational one. Such a history involves a, synth a synthetic investigation of complex investigations between the people of distinct backgrounds and orientations. It transcends the historian's more traditional focus on political, religious, or cultural distinct communities seen primarily through their own lenses. Maritime history is an excellent gateway into this, since as a subject, it is a subject of interdisciplinary, interregional inquiry. Maritime history covers obvious topics like shipbuilding, maritime trade, oceanic exploration, human migration, naval history with a uh, uh, of trade or warfare. Considered from this perspective, the premise of maritime history is that the study of events that take place on or in relation to the water offer unique insights into human affairs. The maritime historians, therefore, draw on such disciplines as arts, religion, language, law, and political economy. In the past few decades, have witnessed a sea of change in how we approach maritime history in other regions, in the Atlantic, in the Mediterranean, 
And I think it is time for us to translate, transplant this framework onto the Black Sea as well, to investigate more the transnational um, history of the Black Sea, not through the narrow confines of Georgian, Turkish, Russian, or Ukrainian identities, but to see the commonalities between the Black Sea littoral as a whole. It is about time to see this new historical framework applied to our most hospitable uh, uh, of seas and examine how over the long course of history, the Black Sea has more often been a bridge rather than a barrier, linking religious communities, linguistic groups, empires, later nations and states into a region as real as any around the world. Such a history would be a prize of a great value. And if the first person to attempt it should fail altogether, they may still have the merit of encouraging others to achieve it. Thank you. Uh, dear Professor, thank you so much for your stimulating uh, presentation, both about the region itself and let's change the way of looking at the history. Let's rewrite it again and change the way of look. I remember like, you know, look at the connections rather than seeing the things as it is. So transnational, writing something trans transnationally will really foster the uh, looking, the way of looking, I see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, the subject, as you pointed out, the subject of my last book was the Napoleonic Wars of the Global History. And, and much has been written about Napoleon and Napoleonic Wars in the past 200 years, but uh, we have faced the same kind of problem there. That is, it is narrowly uh, written within national confines. It's French history or in the Franco-centric history, Anglo-centric history. Um, uh, and in, 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 in this book, what I try to do is to broaden the confines of Napoleon history and to show the interconnectedness of events that take place in the Black Sea region, for example, to the events that have take place in Europe, or to broaden even more, since the tight, subtitle of the book is a global history, to look at Napoleonic Wars as a global history. And that is an, as a global phenomenon, a transnational uh, event and I think the Black Sea region is a good is a good gateway for us to attempt something uh, that uh, Brodel uh, accomplished for the Mediterranean Sea to underscore the connections and shared past rather than to look at it through the uh, uh, narrow prism of national history. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it is a big, rich source actually. The whole Black Sea, as you mentioned, six special countries, of course, sharing the borders of the sea, but also the other cultures affecting this connection. This is great. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, OK, uh, now we can move on our second session. Therefore, I would like to uh, invite um, Professor Dr. Associate uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Aydın Şihmantepe to moderate the session. If uh, you are here, Dr. Yes. Şihmantepe. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you okay. uh, for this uh, second session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Aydın Şihmantepe. I am a board member of Maritime History Research Center. We will run the session two together. Session two will last for about an hour. Uh, and like in the morning session, we will have a short question and answer period to complete the presentation. Then we will move on to uh, closing remarks with Admiral Asaj. We have two speakers in this session. Our first speaker is uh, Mr. Vichakur from Istanbul University. She is joining us from Istanbul University uh, and she is a PhD candidate. Her topic covers salt smuggling in this period of international trade in the Ottoman Black Sea. If Ms. Chakur, you're ready, we can start with you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, you have the floor. Please go ahead. Thank you. 
but I am Duygu Çakır. I am attending from Istanbul University. Uh, first of all, my respects to all of you. Uh, <clears throat> today, I will try to explain to you salt smuggling in the Ottoman Black Sea during the international trade period. For this, first, a short introduction to salt and its place in the Ottoman Empire and the monopoly process in Venturu. Salt, which is an indispensable part of nutritional life, has been an important ingredient in every civilization and period. The uses of salt have varied throughout the ages and have had a symbolic value. When we look at the history of salt, it was used as a mean, means of exchanging shopping or as a commercial element and there were periods when it was replaced by money. In fact, the salaries of the soldiers in the Roman army were sometimes paid in the form of the salt. The word salary today comes from the Latin word salarium, which means salt salary. It was thought that the word salty, which is used metaphorically in Turkish today, is derived from here. The Ottoman state had a climate and soil structure suitable for salt production in terms of its geographical location. It has continued to be one of the sources that bring the highest income to the state treasury throughout all periods. While salt management was carried out according to traditions and customs in the Ottoman classical periods, with the salt, with the salt regulation published on March 10, 1862, a period of eating salt vegan and it was put put under a state monopoly. The regulation consisting of a 32 articles is the first special tax written for salt. The introduction of a permit in the sale of salt and prohibition of importing salt were among the most important innovation brought by the regulation in salt management. Due to economic problems of the Ottoman Empire, the income, of, income obtained from salt was first transferred to Rusum Sitte Idarisi or um, six tax revenues, six tax revenues for 10 years, and then to the Duyunu Umumiye Idarisi or public debt administration. It is remarkable that salt, which was obtained and sold illegally in the 19th century, was handled specifically in the Black Sea under the title of smuggling. With the 1884 Treaty of Kuchukainarja, the principle of the Black Sea's closure change and ships with foreign flags began to be seen in the Black Sea. In this period, maritime transport underwent a radical transformation by switching to steam technology on ships. This transformation was also reflected in the Black Sea and Austrian, British, French, and Russian ferry companies began to be seen in the Black Sea waters. The rise of steamship transportation in the Black Sea brawl along the commercial rise in the region. With its systematic and regular voyages, the Austrian Lloyd Company has the most important business potential in the Black Sea. After the Crimean War, Crimean War the French maritime in the Black Sea had an important business vol volume after the Austrian Company. With the presence of Russian, Greek, German, and other private companies in the Black Sea, an environment of international competition emerged in, and the maritime trade period was experienced. As a result, steamships have become the most important means of European economic expansion in the Black Sea. The fact that Austria, Russia, British, and French, French Ferry companies began to appear in the Black Sea led to Black Sea sailors who were Ottoman subjects into a competitive environment. The traditional Ottoman sailing sailors who tried to survive with the steamships faced problems such as not being able to find cargo on their ships and not being able to pay to salaries of the crew and chiefs. For these reasons, the sailors who resorted to salt smuggling carried out the sale and export of the salt 
they walked from Russia on the blind and rocky piers of the Black Sea, where there was there was no official con official control. It can be said that the developments in the Black Sea maritime trade of the 19th century were behind the smuggling of salt into the Black Sea piers. In addition, monopoly practice and prohibitions are among the factors factors that are effective in the emergence of smuggling. These practices lead the seller and the consumer to obtain the monopoly product unofficially. The fact that salt is cheap and abundant in Russia has been effective in the preference of Russian salt by Black Sea smugglers. As smugglers, we can first talk about poor masters and custom officers. They were involved in smuggling by methods such as forgery, forgery of permits, taking bribes and mixing domestic salt with foreign salt. Salt, which was easily obtained from the Russian coast, was smuggled into the Black Sea coast by vehicles such as boats and boats. The smugglers transported the salt, salt they had loaded from the ports of Kerch, Gözleve, Sivastopol, Kefe, and Anapa in the Crimea, Crimea and from the ports of Batumi and Poti in Georgia to the piers in the Black Sea where there was no official control. While smugglers preferred piers such as Kefken, Kerpe, Shile, Kandra, Ava, and Gideros in the western, western Black Sea to store, sell, and export the salt they smuggled. They were active in Trabzon, Polatane, Akçabat, Rize, Gidesun, and all the piers in the eastern Black Sea region. The mentioned piers, piers were sometimes used as shelters, bases of action, and warehouses for smugglers. In order to prevent smuggling, the Duyunu Umumiya administration cooperated with the Minister, Ministry of the Navy and formed its Special Coast Guard teams. Another group engaged in smuggling activities in the port and ports its boatmen tradesmen. In the 19th century, there were no ports in the Black Sea that could accommodate large tonnage ships. For this reason, ships that could, could not enter the ports and dock at the piers had anchored in the open. The cargo and passengers of the ships moved in the open world, transported to shore by boatmen. It has been observed that boatmen frequently resort to smuggling due to their work. One of the methods followed by the sailors of the Black Sea while smuggling is to flag foreign nations on their ships. The main reason for this is the tax issue. In order to benefit from the low tax that foreign nationals benefit from, the sailors who shop their ships with different state nationalities carried out smuggled goods and passenger transport activities. While the visa fee of 20 Kurush was taken from the Ottoman and Russian ships sailing on the Russian coast, the increase of the visa fee to 100 Kurush, which was required to be paid by the Ottoman chief and boss as of 1894, prompted many Ottoman ships to draw the Russian flag. It has been deter determined that boats filled with salt in Akliman in Sinop and Polathane in Trabzon are smuggling by, by drawing Russian flags on their ships. Kefken and Kerpe are the regions where salt smuggling took place in the Black Sea in the 19th century. Kefken and Kerpe, which were in the position of shelter for seafarers due to the difficulty of transportation, were important regions for smugglers. The smugglers who stored the salt they brought from Kerch and Batumi in Kefken were transporting it to Kerpe by boats. The salt transported, transported to the Kerpe were exported to countries such as Bulgaria, Serbia, Varna, Iškodra, and Albania. The smuggle, smugglers were usually last. The inadequacy of the security forces in the region caused the smugglers to move freely. It was observed that the smugglers who used Kefken and Kerpe as a movement base opened fire on the officials 
in charge when they were caught. The fact that smugglers are equipped with firearms in this way has raised the issue of security. The administration has increased its measures in this regard. The smuggling that took place in Kefkan and Kerpe had a lot of trouble for the administration and the Baba Ali or Ottoman state. The Ottomans who were mentioned as smugglers in the beginning later started to talk about smugglers as bandits. Smugglers are included in the concept of bandit tribe because they disturb the peace on and security in the region. In this period, the fact that Mus Muslims of Russia preferred the Black, Black Sea road to reach the Hijaz in order to perform their Hajj rituals also revealed the danger of the spread of cholera disease. Because the ships that would pass through to Black Sea port had to stop by the quarantine and get a medical certificate. Smuggling seafarers have created a danger for the spread of the disease because they don't seek quarantine. The smugglers continue to engage in smuggling, citing that it will cause heavy costs to stop by the consulate and get their documents without. As a result, salt smuggling emerged as a reaction to the Black Sea maritime trade, which was transformed by steam transportation. At the same time, smuggling arose as a reaction to the administration, since the salt monopoly was under the administration of the general public. The 19th century was the region for the European financial and economic expansion of the Black Sea was most extensive and active. The public debt administration or the Unumumiye Idarisi took serious, serious measures to prevent smuggling, implemented heavy legal san sanctions and increased sold revenues, but could not completely prevent smuggling. That's all I'm going to tell you about salt smuggling in the Black Sea. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Chakur, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for giving us a different perspective in Black Sea salt trade and, of course, how the Industrial Revolution and steam power transformed this salt trade, actually, smuggling in the Black Sea region uh, from a maritime history perspective, of course. Thank you very much for your uh, Thank presentation. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is joining us from Kadiraz University, Professor Dr. Mithat Çelikpala. Uh, his topic covers Black Sea history today and tomorrow. If Professor Çelik Pala, uh, if you can hear me, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Hocam, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure also uh, to be part of such a kind of an ex distinguished uh, panels. In fact, I'm just observing and listening all those panels on the history and politics of the Black Sea region uh, from more broad, much broader perspective to, to some specific issues like the presenter just, just before myself on this uh, salt smuggling. Uh, and uh, all those informa informative and insightful uh, presentations and discussions show us, uh, as Professor Mkaberitza mentioned, uh, people, nations, and of course, some sub-regions are interconnected to each other. And therefore, in order to understand the realities of the historical facts of the region, uh, the, the today and the future is just understandable, just to understand the nature and, and the uh, evolve, how the issues are evolving uh, in the last couple of centuries. Therefore, I would like to touch upon different issues from a Turkish uh, perspective. I'm not a historian by profession, but of course, to discuss all those issues from a uh, international relations or political science perspective, uh, one needs to understand the historical realities of the region, as well as uh, the legal aspects of all those issues and economy and, of course, culture of all those people. We are all connect interconnected 
uh, we have many linkages to each other. We have shared past. And this past not is always full of uh, good days and then some productive and I don't know, attractive stories. But of course we have some issues we are tackling with each other. And then as again, professor mentioned different nations, empires have their uh, historical realities and we are the remnants of all those uh, historical facts. Uh, now we have different frontiers, of course, different sub-regions, but they are all interrelated to each other. And Turkey, of course, from this perspective is one of those linkages, not only uh, linking East and West and North and South, but people and cultures as well. Uh, it is a mixture of different people and we are sharing all those realities in, in the current uh, developments. Uh, I don't want to uh, make a, such a kind of an historical resume of all those issues just because all those uh, professors or presenters before myself, even during the uh, morning session, touched upon those issues. But I try to analyze the, the, the current uh, affairs of the Black Sea region, uh, a, a kind of a Turkish perspective, of course, but a more regional, and try to uh, comment on the featured potential future developments within our region or the Black Sea region. But beforehand, I would like to touch upon them, some historical facts as well. And, and uh, I am trying to limit myself with the, the, the period of just after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, because all those historians, especially Professor Mika Beritze, touch all those historical issues very elegantly and very insightfully, informative way. Uh, from a Turkish perspective, of course, this is uh, uh, an important uh, region for Turkey. Uh, and since the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Turkey has a very well-defined policy towards the Black Sea region and its neighbors in this region. This is called regional ownership. And this makes the Black Sea region a kind of a region for outsiders, of course, a kind of a sub-region for the other greater areas. Uh, it's a part of uh, different people and nations and the global factors, but you know, it gives some, some priorities to those regional actors. And this regional ownership policy in the Black Sea uh, has primarily been shaped by its Turkey's desire uh, to develop a kind of a regional cooperation scheme involving the Black Sea countries. The, the key word is uh, here is the cooperation, regional cooperation, because you know our historical background or historical uh, luggage is full of uh, wars and competition and disagreements. And we remember as Turks, we remember the First World War, what happened during the Cold War, uh, and therefore with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Turkey's priority or the decision makers' priority is to create a kind of a cooperation scheme with the participation of all those uh, literals or riparian countries. And therefore it is very smart and, and, and timely to define this policy as a regional ownership policy. And th there is a one important aspect of this regional policy. Uh, Turkey is, or was of course in the, those days, but is a longstanding NATO member country uh, and, and sponsored many multilateral economic, military, and political cooperation mechanisms uh, to provide for the security and stability of the Black Sea littles and repairing countries. Therefore, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the, Turkey was the only uh, NATO member country. Today, it's a different story, but I'm going to uh, give some basic insights initially and then touch those issues. Then what Turkey did to promote this regional ownership scheme in, in, in the Black Sea region. And all you know, and the previous speakers time to time touched upon uh, the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, BSEC, which was established in 1992. Uh, and the Black Sea Naval Cooperation Task Group, Black Sea C4, and Admiral Metin Atach is one of those pillars of this, this policy, and it's very important for all of us. Uh, and then Operation Black Sea Harmony in March 2004, and those are the multilateral cooperation schemes that were designed to, to, to serve the regional ownership 
policy relies within the region. And you see, as you see, the priority is economic and commercial cooperation. And people believe that through economic interaction and, and of course, trade relations, it's possible to, peop- to, to touch upon each other. People can easily touch each other and people can easily visit each other and develop a kind of a new environment, a peaceful environment for, uh, for, the, for the good or the sake of all those little states. Uh, there is another aspect. Turkey, of course, is a NATO member country, and the idea behind the foundation of uh, was, how can I say, uh, not only highlighting the importance of Turkey as a, a Black Sea actor, pro- prominent Black Sea actor, but also preventing the region from turning into a kind of a theater of military conflicts between the West and Russia as a result of NATO and EU enlargements in those days into the region. And of course, this is a reality and many literals now uh, are NATO and EU member countries. Some others have different political identities within the region, but the reality is that there is a kind of a, a synergy between all those actors as a literal actors. And those regional security initiatives indicated that maintaining unique relations with Russia without without alienating NATO partners was essential for Turkey's Black Sea policy. This is also an important aspect of uh, the the early 20th and 21st centuries Turkish policy towards these regions. Because you know, you already know, Turkey managed to establish good and friendly, peaceful relations with Russia, and together with Turkey and Turkish and Russian cooperation is a potential uh, contributor to the, to the regional cooperation and peace within this Black Sea region. And uh, there is a, a kind of a infrastructure or political and legal uh, context, which is the, the Montreal Convention of 1936 as well. And therefore, this convention regulates the transit of warships through the straits that cover the Istanbul uh, or Bosphorus, the Marmara Sea, and, and the Çanakkale, Dardanelles, uh, and guarantees the freedom of passage of civilian vessels in times of uh, peace and war. In sum, historically, Turkey's priorities in the Black Sea region has been listed as, as follows. Then we can move towards the current issues, and then afterwards, most probably, we can easily uh, comment or, or say some, some words on the future of the region. The first uh, uh, priority is to prevent the region from uh, becoming a major theater of power rivalry between big powers. Uh, We have the historical facts and the previous speakers very eloquently mentioned the the, the war between empires and the competition between different big nation states. And and during the Cold War era, the area itself was a kind of a uh, Cold War theater of, of, for between the big powers. Therefore, for the, uh, for the uh, late 19th, 20th century and early 21st century, uh, the priority is to prevent the region from becoming a kind of a theater of power rivalry between big powers. And secondly, of course, to promote Turkey as a bastion of the Western alliance in the neighborhood. Turkey defined itself in those days, a kind of a Western actor, and try to link all those actors, the regional actors, to the Western and other big powers as well. And revitalizing all those schemes to work together uh, for better futures. And the other one is not offending Russia. This is also an important pillar of Turkish policy. Uh, And of course, Montreux Convention helped us uh, to prevent any kind of a clash between the parties. I don't want to deal with the conventions, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, small aspects or or codes, Uh, but of course, if you would like to do the question and answer session, I may try to touch upon all those issues. Uh, Currently, what happened after this long uh, history, in fact, last 20 years? Currently, uh, still, for Turkey, we have traditionally preferred collective security mechanisms uh, involving all little states. It's on the table. And of course, uh, all those developments and uh, in 
that since 2008 changed the environment and the political environment within the Black Sea region. This is a fact. Now we have Bulgaria, Romania are EU member countries and NATO member countries. Turkey is also a NATO member country. Uh, we, what happened in, in Georgia uh, has some direct effects on those political environment, but still the parties have a potential to get together and to, to find some ways uh, to cooperate with each other. Uh, of course, crime issue, Ukrainian developments, uh, all those energy related issues are on the table and they are not easy issues to, to deal with that issue. Therefore, uh, the big powers within the region, like Turkey, has a priority and has a role to, to bring the parties all together and to work together for the brighter future and to resolve those issues within the region. Uh, for Turkey, as I said, uh, it is very important uh, to revive all those collective security mechanisms within the regions involving all the little states uh, and reluctant, Turkey is reluctant to non returns in the region to keep the Black Sea as a stable maritime domain. Then how to balance it? The current uh, tense and, and the limitation on Turkish policy within the region is this limitation. Of course, we have Russia and Russia is a reality of this uh, region and one of those big uh, powers. Uh, and Russian military buildup in the Black Sea is altering the regional, altering the Black Sea's regional balance of power to the disadvantages of other littles, undermines time to time Ankara's traditional approach and cooperative security mechanisms. But still, there is a potential for all of us to, 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 to live together and to find some ways to resolve all those issues. Uh, there are some threats that we can concentrate on those threats and to find some ways to move forward uh, by taking historical lessons and lessons learned are very important for all of us. And we see that for 20 years almost, there is a potential within the region that the parties have a potential and understanding of each other. And this is an historical uh, heritage to all of us. We know each other. And if there is a potential to touch upon each other, we move forward. This is the case. Uh, what are those realities within the region currently? There is a kind of an increasing naval presence. All literal states are uh, very active militarily and naval powers are very strong comparing with uh, last uh, 20 years or 30 years. As a result, we have some kind of an air missions, not only Russia, Turkey, uh, or the literals, but of course, and NATO air force air missions are very active within the region. Uh, there's a kind of a persistent rotational ground for presence. It's also very important. All this crime issue, Ukraine, Russia, uh, rivalry, uh, what's happening in Georgia are still on the table, but the parties have a potential to, to, to discuss those issues all together. <laughs> And, and there are some kind of increasing exercises and uh, combined training events within the region itself. And we are working on those issues. And of course, uh, there is a need to clarify and enhance the comprehensive approach in the Black Sea. This is the current issue. Uh, and given the current predicament, Ankara as a big actor in the region, faces whether to prioritize security challenges on it is northern and southern flank, which means linking uh, the Black Sea region or the Black Sea to the Mediterranean is a big issue. Uh, and the Turkish decision makers must strike a balance between the objective to project power in the south and to counter Russian ambitions in the north on the one hand and to prevent ground losses in the Black Sea and Mediterranean. This is a reality. But issue is not only a security issue. When we securitize the issue, it is tough to find some ways, and it's not easy for the people and the nations to touch upon each other and to find some ways. Therefore, for the future, what we have to be careful. For the future, uh, of course, it is not wise for all of us to concentrate on the security related matters only and solely. And we have to revitalize regional ownership mechanisms because, you know, all those regional actors have almost the same issues and problems. 
we have to limit those security oriented approaches and without the involvement of all those outside powers towards the region, regional actors or literals needs to find some ways to get together. I don't know whether it's a kind of a revitalizing already existing institutions. They are so silent. They are not working properly, but the literal states have a potential and, and have, have some kind of a, a chance to bring all the parties together. And of course, uh, we have to enhance joint projects within literal states. And this is also an important uh, policy priority for all of us, uh, especially the smaller units in the Black Sea and Turkey has to work together to find some new joint economic projects. And you know, all those projects are now uh, not very actively uh, realized by the parties and we are just observing very silent region focused on security related issues. Therefore, we have to find some ways to energize all those issues uh, through those new joint economic and trade projects, especially COVID environment affected very negatively what's happening in the region. Therefore, parties need to get, get together to find some ways. Uh, we have some serious issues other than the others. For example, to fight against any kind of an illegal trafficking, uh, you know, all those what's happening in, in Central Asia and Afghanistan, what's going on in the Middle East in Syria. And we see flow of people and other kind of trafficking. And the Black Sea is one of those centers and all those institutions are very active to produce some policies altogether to resolve those issues and create a kind of a Black Sea uh, notion or narrative for the environment. And more than that, it is very practical. And I know that all those naval powers and, and, and of course uh, other units and naval units are working together uh, to increase kind of an environmental awareness in the region and establishing joint early warning mechanisms uh, climate change or pollution those are the issues most probably in the future we all get together by taking the historical lessons learned into uh, in front of us and try to find some ways to develop such a kind of mechanisms. This is the only way, I think, to move forward and to find some ways uh, for a better future uh, serving interests and expectations of all those regional actors. Uh, this is very serious. And there are other issues uh, taking Turkey into the center. But what we need is to find some ways, of course, Russia is an act, important actor in this region. We need to find some ways and means uh, to tackle with Russia and to work with Russia. Of course, uh, other literal historical uh, experiences with Russia is much bigger than Turkey, but Turkey also have a, an experience last 30 years uh, with Russia as well. Therefore, uh, before finishing my presentation, I would like to say that history brings many stories and still we have connections and linkages. Our shared parts are pressing us to find some uh, creative ways and means to work together, to live together. Uh, this region is an important sub-region of Europe or, or Asia or Eurasia. Uh, how can we develop and how can we shape the region in the coming future is just depend on us. Therefore, we have to get together and we have to establish those networks uh, to resolve our issues within the region itself. I would like to thank you for your attention. Let me stop here. If there are some kind of questions and comments, I try to make myself more clarified. Thank you very much. Dear Professor, thank you very much for your uh, comprehensive, I should say, uh, presentation. Now we will proceed with the questions here an answer period. I'm sure there will be some questions directed to you. Uh, dear participants, please use chat box for your uh, questions. While you're typing them, I have two questions for each speaker, if I may. The first question goes to Ms. Chakur. If you're here, Ms. Chakur, can you hear me? I cannot hear you. 
Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, thank you for your speech one more time. My question is, okay, we understand that salt trade and in parallel to salt trade, there's a smuggling issue. And the, the part like from Russia to Ottoman part, Russia may not take any steps, but have you made any research on the steps that Ottoman part took, such as building new forces like today's Coast Guard or Customs Police, etc. Because for them, it meant uh, losing of taxes. Smuggling part, I mean. Am I Aydın hocam, çok özür diliyorum. Sorunuzu Türkçe alabilir miyim acaba? Peki. Ee, tamam, bu hem tuz e, alışverişi bir yandan da bunun kaçakçılığı vesairenin yapıldığı bir ortamda Osmanlı tarafı kendi vergi kayıplarını önlemek için ekstradan bir kuvvet bir birim kurmuş mu onu soruyorum. Yani bu konuda bir araştırma yaptınız mı? Osmanlı evet. kuvveti tekrar alabilir miyim anlayamadım. Osmanlı tarafı bu e, kaçakçılıktan vesaireden dolayı e, kaybettiği vergileri e, elinde tutabilmek için bir tedbir almış mı kıyılarında? Öyle yani mi? onu... Onunla ilgili bir e, veriye ben rastlamadım ama zaten şöyle bir şey var. 1881 yılından beri tuzun e, tekeli düğün ömümiye idaresine ait olduğu için e, tuzun tüm tekeli e, Cumhuriyet dönemine kadar düğün ömümiye de kalıyor ve e, düğün ömümiye idaresi tuz kaçakçılığıyla kendisi e, uğraşmak zorunda kalıyor ama zaman zaman Osmanlı Devleti ile birlikte işbirliği içinde oluyor. Teşekkür ederim. Ben teşekkür ederim. Uh, Profesör Çelik Bala, next question comes to you from my part, if I may. I remember you saying that we should uh, quit or skip security-oriented approach in the Black Sea region, which I totally agree, personally. Does that necessarily mean that you don't expect much security threat to uh, security of maritime transportation in the Black Sea region in the coming near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ojan. Uh, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, we, are, how can I say, on this international relations or security uh, related people are concentrated on those security related issues mostly. And we, we incline to securitize many issues, including those trade, uh, pipelines, energy, transportation, immigration, and, and environment as well. Uh, this is the reason why I am just uh, trying to be a little bit critical of this, this kind of a, a securitizing approach. We may find some other ways to normalize uh, the relations and human to human relations, And historians are inclined to, to, to read all those archival work and look at the historical facts and realities. But, you know, we are just dealing with ongoing issues and events. This is the reason most probably why we are concentrated on mostly security related issues. Uh, for the naval uh, security, of course, the Black Sea region is an important outlet for Russian naval power. And this affects from different aspects of regional balance and security. And this is the reason why the other literals have a kind of a threat perception, especially, especially uh, oriented uh, or towards Russian uh, attitude and aggressiveness in this region. But before and last two decades, uh, all the literal actors, including Russia itself, managed to find some, some ways to control and balance each other. And in the near future, of course, this balance is now just broad, broken. And in this broken balance, how to rebalance within the region, it's a big question mark. This is the reason why NATO and other Western allies are very seriously working on this issue and producing many documents. But what I am saying is that, of course, as a NATO member country citizen, and, and, and of course, researcher, uh, It is the fact that we are just looking the issue, looking at the issues from this perspective. But on the other hand, we are a literal and one of those biggest powers within the region. How to work and how to find some ways to balance uh, 
all those security threats. For the transportation, uh, the issue is most probably is just linked with the energy. But you know, energy transportation mechanisms has changed a lot uh, within the region itself. Uh, therefore, from this perspective, if your question is concentrated on this kind of a transportation and checking uh, the maritime trafficking within the region, of course, it is uh, limited. We, we can easily control such a kind of a traffic. But there are two other discussion, uh, discussions, in fact. One is, of course, nuclear energy. And this is the, the uh, nuclear transport uh, trans, uh, facility. Uh, in, in the south of Turkey and Russians are constructing this facility and they are gonna bring all those, uh, how can I say, west and as well as uh, nuclear uh, resources from the north towards the south via Bosphorus. And then they are gonna take it back to, to Russian soils. This might be an issue for the future. Of course, all those related bodies are working on this, but you know this is a limitation. The second one is, of course, very lively discussion within the region. This this canal Istanbul discussion. I didn't touch upon this issue very. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to go this in detail because you know this this just takes uh, big discussions within Turkey itself uh, regarding uh, Montreux Convention as well as its uh, economic and financial aspects. And it has some direct political uh, connotations and repercussions on it. Uh, I don't know if this project as well realized or started, it might have some effects on the security within the region itself. Uh, then most probably we may start to discuss different aspects of all those developments in the coming future. These are the other issues or potential issues that uh, uh, may the actors and even Turkey itself may securitize different issues again uh, but we have to we have to take all those issues very seriously and then we have to work on those uh, details very seriously as well again thank you sir for your answer actually what i was uh, trying to imply more than security was like humanitarian pollution prevention, fishing cooperation, et cetera, which would help build that uh, security by itself within the Black Sea region. That was what I meant, actually. Yeah, exactly. But on those issues, you know, literals have many projects. They can easily get together and produce uh, joint projects to, to serve the, uh, the, better, uh, and the better future for the region itself. Uh, but the security-related issues makes the literals uh, to refrain to get together. You know, it's not easy to bring all those literals uh, together to discuss all those issues, especially uh, just after the Russian-Georgian war and Ukraine occupation of Crimea. It's not easy to bring all those uh, literals together, and this is the limitation. What we have to find is to, to some ways or some productive ways to bring all the parties together again and to resolve all those re real issues of the people in the region. I agree with you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm still expecting questions from participants. Meanwhile, I have one from Captain Asen uh, Kusuharov. Can you hear me, Captain? Uh, he has a question about the uh, references and uh, archive information, and he wants them to be sent to his email address. I have it over here. You may not be able to see it. I presume he is asking the question to Ms. Rigucucker. If that is so, we will get in touch with you. If not, if and if Captain can hear me now, he can clarify the question. Captain, are you here and can you hear me? Okay, we will go look into that, Mr. Chakur. If the question was for you, we will make you get in touch with him if we can. Another question from, no, as far as I can see, no more questions. Thank you to both of the speakers uh, for their insightful uh, presentations. I personally enjoyed listening to both of them. And now my list shows that we have about, we are about to finish the 
question and answer period. And I'm checking one more time. Last time, if there's any anything else, no. So uh, that completes our session two, the afternoon session. Now I will hand over uh, the microphone to Admiral Atac for his uh, closing remarks. Thank you for joining with us today and sharing your uh, knowledge with all the all the rest of us. Thank you very much. Yes, Admiral Atac. You have the floor, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shimante. It's It's been a long day. Uh, uh, at the beginning, we fought with the uh, technical problems. I, I, I was some kind of in, in panic, but at the end, I, I feel real comfortable. I think uh, uh, we did a good job to, to go ahead and do this symposium. We shouldn't be afraid of technical problems. Uh, we have to uh, we have to work together. Uh, just a minute, I'll telephone. Uh, Black Sea is very important sea for everybody, for literal countries, for the whole world. East, West. Uh, we uh, intended to try to look at the uh, history of the Black Sea this time. Uh, of course, at the beginning, before Chris, around before a 800 centuries, uh, Phoenicians was the first who focused on the area. Then, of course, uh, Romans was very interested with the area. Greeks, during the great uh, colonization time, they have, uh, had a great interest. Then Persians, of course, Venetians, Genoese, then Ottomans, uh, after the conquer of Istanbul, Black Sea, some kind of a, became an Haramein. That means uh, no, no one can go inside but Turks type of thing. And then of course the Russians. Uh, so why, why we are uh, uh, dealing all these things? Uh, of course, uh, uh, history is very important. Uh, we are doing all these things, these international conferences to urge researchers and scholars, academicians to do more, to do more research, find new facts and realities and build up a joint reality uh, books why we do it, this is to prepare ourselves for future. If we don't our past, if we don't know our history, we cannot build up sound and secure future. In the university, of course, we uh, ask our students, our scholars, to do more research. That's why we have established our Maritime Research Center. Maritime history is an area which uh, unfortunately uh, not studied very well, uh, especially in Turkey. So we have to work together with our literal country's archives. I know in Russia, for example, in St. Petersburg, uh, is a very rich archives in, in Moscow. Uh, very, so we have to combine our archives together with our literal countries in the Black Sea. Uh, we, ha we have documents in the Ottoman archives. We have some books, but not enough, not enough. That's why I say these type of symposiums, even in, in spite of the uh, heavy pandemic conditions. I think uh, we're doing our job uh, 
to uh, to lure people to to do uh, some research about the area. Of course, the Black Sea has got a lot of names in the history. During the times of Greeks, uh, it was named Axionos, for example. That means the, the Black Sea people didn't like the outcomers. And the Greeks called this sea as Dark Sea. And afterwards, Mihmane Garis, for example. It's another name. These things should be uh, studied as well. And afterward, it became Misafil Pervar. It means uh, hostile. After the peace has been established, Misafil Pervar means in Turkish uh, hospitable, not hostile, hospitable. And during the uh, Skatios, which in Turkish we say Iskitler, it is called Nemerida. Nemerida means uh, double C. As you know, the shape of the Black Sea is some kind of a two, two, two part. The, the middle part, the middle part is uh, close to each other. Uh, so Nemerida. And again, during the uh, uh, Greeks, uh, Ditalassos, Ditalassos, and after after that time, during the Russians, for example, Sudak Denizi, that is the Soroj Sea in Russian. So uh, Black Sea uh, uh, is worth uh, to work on it, to make research on it. Uh, I will not repeat what has been said, starting with uh, Professor uh, uh, Posnikov and also Professor Naira Tabidze, uh, George Gabadewa. It was all interesting things. And also we had very bright PhD candidates, Emir Yener and Mrs. Duygu Chakr. I think we will see them one day as a professor they were very successful on their subjects. I really enjoyed listening to them. And also, uh, Dr. Mika Beridze, in spite of uh, storm, he uh, joined us and he gave us a huge amount of uh, information and his uh, uh, charts and everything was great. I should add two things to his uh, speech. Maybe he said I missed uh, the, 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 the chart, which was called Mursi el Ibrahim in 1461, which is in the uh, Naval Museum, is also uh, Ibrahim al Mursi al Katibi is very uh, rich. In, uh, has very rich information about Black Sea. And afterwards, uh, 1568, Ali Majar Reis uh, chart series was very also uh, rich and informative. And at the end, of course, uh, my uh, friend, uh, Professor Mitat Celikpala, who's a good friend of mine, he even made a golden weld between past and future. And I uh, totally share what he said about the future also. So he said, limit security oriented problems. Getting together, together with the literal countries are very important, of course. And uh, one thing which he said very important is that an enhanced joint projects. Th these are the key issues. Uh, of course, the future of the Black Sea is another subject. Now we are dealing with the history, but this time we at least wanted uh, Professor Chiripala 
to make that connection between the past and the future. Here, uh, uh, one thing more, which I would like to say to you all, I have seen Professor Dejanara Kuto enter it, the room. Uh, maybe she can hear our, our uh, words concerning the Peter Race Symposium, which we are going to make at the future. Uh, in, in, the, in, in 2022 springtime, we agreed with the Turkish Historical Society, we will make a big, very big Peter Symposium that will be face-to-face -face symposium. Peter University and the Turkish uh, Historical Society together, we will invite uh, the scholars and academicians and researchers from the world to Istanbul or Ankara, but we decide uh, where it's going to take place. Uh, we're, and we're going to make a big symposium because this is Piri's University. Dealing with Piri's history of Piri's, his masterpieces, his uh, two charts, 1513, 1528 charts, I think we should do it. We should uh, make uh, we should match the 1513 maps with the contemporary maps like Juan La Cosa, uh, 1502 Cantino, 1504 Cavaria. We have to make some match who got what from each other. Uh, I'm the member of uh, Academia Marina from Portuguese uh, in Lisbon. I'm the only Turk there. And I gave two conferences about this, about peer race there. They are interested too much. There are a lot of people there in Portugal. Uh, maybe uh, Professor Kuto confirms. Uh, so I think uh, we're gonna, but let's finish this pandemic first. Pandemic really, uh, it's just a disastrous thing. Uh, we cannot do it with the Zoom. It is very tiring, a lot of technical problems. We cannot do it with Zoom, but we will do face-to-face. -face. Again, maybe it's some kind of a combination, Zoom and face-to-face. -face. We, we will do that. So our next step is Peter Ray's conference in Turkey. Get ready, start working do some researches, find new things, find new things. I'm sure Peter Reyes had some more masterpieces, but we don't know. We don't know. We don't know the other parts of the, uh, of the charts, somewhere, somewhere in the world, maybe. I don't know. Okay, I will not uh, speak much, not much. Uh, uh, I wish all... Uh, successful uh, without pandemic uh, healthy days. I would like to thank again our rector, Professor Oral Erdogan and our uh, president, uh, Mr. Tamer Kran, and our people here, Dr. Funda, Dr. Shihman Tepe, and the other technical people. Uh, so I say goodbye. See you, see you in, 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 in Turkey in the Piraeus Conference. Dr. Dr. Atak, thank yes. you very much. I guess uh, Professor Dejanar. When... Yes, can I yes, say please. something? Okay, uh -huh. because I am in Portugal actually, so uh, I would like to express my regrets of uh, not being able to attend this, I'm sure, beautiful session on a very interesting topic, uh, which is the Black Sea. Um, I, as a marit maritime historian, I'm also uh, interested in the Black Sea. But unfortunately, today I had also several other uh, meetings, not, not really research meetings, but uh, institutional meetings uh, for the universities and I could not uh, attend, but this does not impeach me to join you 
and uh, to welcome also and to be very grateful to Admiral Attach and to the all the staff from PD Reyes University from the wonderful job that they are doing and we are also contributing uh, to this success and I would like to add that two days ago I uh, and myself and Professor Philip Castro from Texas AM and out from Lisbon University, we finished the editing of these 600, new 600 pages on the uh, history of shipbuilding, which was the PD Race Congress of 2018. At one point, we thought that we would not be able uh, to edit uh, this huge volume of contributions, but I have a strong commitment and a strong will to, <laughs> and I think that we are indebted to Piri Reis and to all to our Turkish friends uh, who organized the, the, the three, uh, the third conf um, Congress in Tuzla. And so it was for us an uh, opportunity to thank our Turkish friends and colleagues and to uh, commit ourselves to preparing this book. So this book is going to be a wonderful book. Uh, this evening, I will send the status of the book for the printing house uh, to Mrs. Um, Songur. And I would like to thank uh, also all the, um, the esteemed director and all the authorities and all the colleagues, Turkish colleagues, and all the colleagues around the world who also collaborated in this huge volume, who which be, will be the second big volume uh, edited by P. Reyes on maritime history. The one was the one of uh, 2014, and I hope this one will be the one of 2021-22. And this is a major contribution with contributions only not from Turkey, but also from Italy, from France, from the United States, and even from Mexico uh, on shipbuilding. And the best specialists uh, participated in this volume. So thank you very much for all your efforts, uh, for all your commitment. And this is a collective work. So we are, you see now I am in Portugal and has Admiral Attach is only the only Turk who is a member of the Naval Academy uh, of the, the Portuguese Navy. And they are willing to have Admiral Attach again for another conference. So the perspectives are open uh, to make again something in Lisbon because the Naval Academy of Lisbon also uh, published in the bilingual edition, English and Portuguese, uh, our um, lectures uh, related to Piri Reis. Uh, with the participation of Admiral Attach and some others. So the work is going on. So thank you very much. And I hope we will see not only in these uh, wonderful lectures, conferences and congresses, but also in publications, the, the result, the outcome uh, of all our efforts, of our joint efforts from Portugal, from Turkey, and from the other countries. And I must say that in this book of the shipbuilding, there's a strong um, intervention of the Portuguese group. So we gave the floor first to the Turkish papers because Turkey had been the invited country, uh, the, the country that invited uh, with the Congress. And there's a, a strong group of Portuguese researchers in, in this book, about five, six contributions. Uh, so we have also a joint venture because we are all two maritime countries, uh, either Atlantic 
either Mediterranean and Black Sea and Red Sea, but oceans are connected and oceans are also connecting us. <laughs> so okay. thank you very much for giving me the floor for these few minutes. And I hope we will be able to see her presentially not on Zoom uh, in the very new, near future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Thank, thank you. you so and much. Thank you. A special thank you to uh, Funda because she has been all of uh, extraordinary uh, help for us in the preparation of this book was a rather demanding one. Thank you very much. Dear Professor, thank you so much for your additional in, uh, interesting um, feedback and what is going on today and what we yes. are going to do uh, near future. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Was, thank you to all of you. Nice to see you, Dejanur. Yes, so thank you, Admiral. Thank you. I also, uh, Professor Simantepo, all the ones that I met in Piri Reis. Uh, the advantage of Zoom is that we don't feel so far, right? Yes, you are. But, uh, but we don't feel so far. But anyway, the important is that we keep on uh, working, you know, in the network, <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in academic network. And I think this PD Race network has been working very well because we are publishing. We are, we are, you know, it's, uh, I think this new publication shows that we are doing a, a valuable work. And I hope we'll have new conferences, perhaps pre presential ones, on new topics on the sea. <laughs> we will. <laughs> you will, okay. Yes. I think uh, we, the Red Sea should be perhaps the next topic. Yeah. Uh, yes. Now we made the, the, the Black Sea, but there are also so many interests and uh, Ottoman Turkish history on the Red Sea. So I think we will be willing to, to move on forward. So new perspectives. Uh -huh. And I hope once this shipbuilding book appears. Yeah, so, but thank you very much for all your all efforts. I hope I will have the papers to know thank a little you. bit better. Thank you we, so good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, I have received some email, uh, messages that Captain Aizen uh, Kusuharo, your question will be directed to uh, Ms. Chakır, uh, and you will be receiving your, quest your answer to your question through emails. Uh, we wrote it down. And in the meantime, we have been receiving several thank you messages. We thank you for all of you for being here to be part of our symposium today. Uh, actually, um, it should be emphasized that the Black uh, Sea has been of strategic importance to the countries, especially of the region, by security, economy, and several social aspects. We would like to underline this crucial uh, and this uh, importance today in our symposium, once again, by drawing attention to the history of the Black Sea in uh, maritime merits. It's our aim to reveal uh, unknown maritime issues. Uh, and all of, some of them are distinguished here today by our two special keynote speakers and five special academicians. Uh, therefore, as Maritime History Research Center, uh, I would like to thank to all participants who came here and uh, delivered their speech and paper to us. Um, and I would like to remind it to each participant, I will be sending um, emails containing the um, certificate of attendance. Before ending the symposium, I would uh, like to mention that we are grateful to our rector, to the chairman of the board of trustees, to all of the guests here who are listening right now. 
uh, having an online symposium, of course, you know that it is not an easy task. I also uh, would like to take this opportunity to thank to our previous university personnel, uh, especially to Directorate of Information Technology, External Relations and Organizations, and of course, Administrative Affairs. Uh, we all hope to meet in future events on maritime history as Professor Kuto put forth, maybe the um, Red Sea. I hereby close International Symposium on the Lake Sea Maritime History. Thank you very much for your kind attendance. I wish you a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>